Well, hello, everyone. My name is John Cornicello, and I welcome you to my series of live interactive photo conversations. You can check the schedule at cornicello.com slash conversations for dates and times of upcoming shows and links to previous ones. Uh, today, my guest is Rick Smolin. Most of us probably know Rick from his days in the life of photography series of books that he co-founded in the 1980s. It's actually 40 years this year, this year. Uh, or you may know his interactive CD-ROM from Alice to Ocean or 24 Hours in Cyberspace. He's now CEO of Against All Odds of Productions, working on large-scale global photo projects, combining storytelling with state-of-the-art technology. So please welcome Rick Smolin. <laughs> yeah, so I didn't realize till last night that it was 40 years since the, the book was launched. Yeah, wow. I, I can't believe it either. <laughs> so he wrote those books when he was eight? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Thank you. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I have a painting in the closet that's getting much older. <laughs> so it sounds like you started out with your dad giving you a camera, but encouraging you to not pursue photography. You know, ah. um, it, there's a long story behind this, but when I was about 30 years old, I was visiting with my aunt and she said something in the middle of this conversation, like, well, that was, you know, because your dad didn't really like, you know, being a photographer in World War II. And I said, what? She said, and she went completely red. I said, wait. My father, my father was a photographer in World War II. When I was a kid, my dad was so adamant that I not be, a, I, he gave me a camera as you know a hobby and it's all I ever wanted to do since I was 16. And he said, I'm not sending you, you're not gonna be a photographer. I, I don't, you know, my, you're gonna be a doctor or a lawyer. Uh, yeah, you know, you're not gonna do weddings and baby portraits. I'm not sending you to college to do that. Um, so he wouldn't let me go to any university with a, a photography program in it. Um, I was painfully shy when I was a kid. So um, my dad gave me this camera at 16. I could talk to girls for the first time, uh, which is probably common of both men and women in terms of you know being able to socialize. Um, uh, I always thought when I was growing up, because I would watch my friends who were so who could so easily strike up a conversation with complete strangers, and I had no idea how to do that. And so I I would spend all my time watching other people and thinking if I watched enough, I could learn how to do it. So it, it, it I, you know, gravitating to being a photographer was perfect because I could sort of be there, but not be there. Um, I was accused most of my life of my family of, could you put the damn camera down and actually like engage with us instead of always being <laughs> on the outside? I once, think once many I of us had, know that feeling. Yeah, I, I think it's probably pretty common amongst photographers. So um, anyway, I went to college and uh, I Where? managed in, within, within a, a Dickinson College, Carlisle, Pennsylvania. Um, and uh, I managed to find uh, an art professor who let me literally create my own photography major the first week I, as a freshman, uh, which just infuriated my father to no end. Because um, uh, he kept saying, you know, you have a D minus average, you never finish anything. You're, we didn't know what ADD was back then, but I was like the classic <laughs> case. Um, I was apparently smart, but completely unmotivated. So I had terrible grades. I only did what I wanted to do, um, you know, and uh, anyway, long story short is uh, my college professor uh, who let me create my own, um, you know, uh, mass uh, program in photography knew a guy in Tennessee. Did any of you ever know Jack Korn who ran um, Image, the Image Photo Agency? I never, even, I never even heard of a photo agency when I was in college and my uh, art professor said, there's this guy, you can put a bunch of boxes in a print, mail it to him and his wife, and he'll sell your pictures. And I said, to who? He said, well, you know, he'll sell them to textbook publishers and religious oh. publications. And I said, okay. So I took all these pictures I'd shot for the yearbook and newspaper, stuck them in a box. He said, put your name on the back of them. I said, oh, okay. I didn't know that. So I put my name on the back. And a month later, he sent me a check for a thousand dollars, which in 1970 was like $10,000 today. And it was like, I've never had a job my whole life, thanks to that guy. I mean, basically, you know, imagine making that kind of money in, in college um, as a freshman, taking pictures of my friends. The funniest thing is I would photograph my friends and uh, Jack would say, you know, we're looking for um, adolescent girls looking depressed. I said, why? He said, well, textbook publishers, they're looking for a picture of a, a girl sitting under a tree looking sad. And it's going to say adolescents, you know, suffer from bouts of depression during, you know, college. And so... I'd, I'd, you know, pose my friend sitting under trees looking depressed and we'd all, you know, go out and, you know, have, you know, wine and beer as a result of this. So it was, it was, wow. you know, it was, it was great. Um, so so is that mostly editorial or did you have to do model releases and the like? No, back then nobody cared. 
as long as you weren't, you know, saying something, you know, uh, um, something, you know, if you were, if you were libeling them, then I guess you need it. Mm -hmm. Hey, Harris. Um, so it looks like John, I, I'm getting all the uh, requests Hi, for admission. Rick. I'll take care of those. Hey. That's because you, you're okay, a co-host, so you can share. Thank you. Okay, but feel free to say that. hi to people as they come in. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I will. Um, so so I, I don't know how many I don't know how many of you feel this way, but I never studied photography. So every time I got an assignment, I would go from "This is so cool, I can't believe I got an assignment for like the National Enquirer or whatever," and then I would go from that to "Oh shit, they're gonna find out I have no idea what the hell I'm doing, and I'm gonna screw it up, and it'll be the end of my career." So I would always <laughs> go on the sort of like high to, "Oh no, I'm an imposter," and I didn't find out till years later that most of my peers that I met in the field, everybody was pretty much self-taught. I don't think I know anybody that ever went to, film, to photography school. Some people did, but um, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't anything you needed to do. And what I loved is that you could, that feedback loop, the idea that you could teach yourself, you could do something, go to the dark room. I mean, now it's astounding. You can actually look down at your camera and see if it worked. But back then, that idea that um, you could, you know, in the same day, go back and develop your film and uh, and then say, oh, that didn't work. We're going to try this next time. So, so many of us were just self-taught, you know. So. so once you got some photos together and selling things, you headed out to New York to try to meet people at Time Life. Um, you know, after I graduated from college, um, they uh, the college hired me to become the college photographer. So I actually spent two more years you know, uh, what is that joke about never let your classes interfere with your college education? <laughs> uh, I, you know, Dickinson was great. It's Carlisle, Pennsylvania. I had a house uh, that a whole group of us lived in. So uh, they hired me to be the college photographer and I hired three of my friends. So they gave us a dark room, unlimited film, unlimited chemicals and paper um, in this little building on the side of campus. And so I hired, I sort of subbed the job out to my friends and as they started freelancing. So again, it was just a fantasy because I didn't have to pay for anything. Um, and a friend of mine saw an article in Popular Photography saying that they were going to do a day in the life of America. It was called One Day in the Life of America. And it was going to be 99 photographers. And so my friend said, you know, you should, you should go work on that. I said, they're going to hire some college photographer. He said, no, really, you should go up there. Like, you know, you, you have really good pictures. So he sort of you know, taught, we had a bet. He bet, he bet me $25. I would get hired. I bet him 25. I wouldn't. So I, I went to New York, did not have an appointment, went to the time life building and um, went to the reception desk and said, I knew that, you know, in the article it said John Lowengar was director of photography. And so I went to the reception desk and said, I'd like to see, I was so naive. I was wearing a t-shirt, jeans and sneakers. I mean, that's how I got dressed for this, in this possible interview. Um, and I had my yearbook and I had a box of prints. And uh, so I went to the reception desk and said, I'd like to see John Lohengren. said, you know, do you have an appointment? I said, no, but I, I, I want to work on this special issue. And the woman said, you know, you can't just show up here. You have to have an appointment. And I said, well, how do I do that? And well, you have to write or call, whatever. It was, it was basically go away. So um, I walked out of the building. And um, as I was walking out, uh, I saw these guys walking into the building in the, in the back of, around the corner there's a freight entrance and they were all wearing white t-shirts jeans and sneakers and i saw sam flax across the street so i thought you know this is gonna be a great story to my friend i knew none of us was i didn't actually think any of this would work so i went across the street i wrapped up my yearbook in the paper in brown paper and string like all the other guys walking into the building and i just followed them into the freight elevator i knew what floor he was on because while i was waiting in the reception area i heard other people saying you know 10th floor you know life magazine so I got off the 10th floor. I went to the receptionist on that floor. And she said, who's the package for it? I'd written John Lohengar on the outside of the package. And, uh, and she said, well, I'll take the package. I said, well, no, I actually have to hand deliver it. And she said, well, no, you have to give me the package. And then and there was something with the package that obviously didn't look right or something. Maybe that'd be stamped or something downstairs. And she said, you know, what are you doing here? And I said, I, I, I'm a photographer and I want to show him my work. And she got really angry and said, you, you just, would you sneak in here or something? Like, you, you have to get here right now. I'm going to call security. And she said, just go. So I went back to the elevator and I thought, okay, well, again, this is, I'm going to tell my friend, I really tried. And I pushed the down button. And I remember thinking, you know, in a movie, like what would the hero do at this moment? And I thought, I was thinking I would have given anything to be her. In my mind, if you worked at Life Magazine, um, 
you know, the idea of seeing life before it came out, I would dream entire issues of life. I mean, I was so obsessed with Life Magazine and also Superman comics. I would literally dream entire episodes of Superman. Um, and so I thought, you know what? They probably don't even let her see the issue before it comes out. Like how unfair is that? She's the receptionist, but they don't let her see the issue. So I said, you know, I'm gonna go back. I'm gonna show her four of my best pictures. I know it's not, I kept telling myself, this isn't gonna work, but I kept saying, this would be a good story to tell my friend. So I went back to her desk and she's on the phone and she's giving me looks like, what the hell are you doing back here? And I'm trying not to make eye contact. And I, I decided, okay, so I, I opened the box, I pull out four prints and I'm so nervous at this point, realizing how stupid all this is that I'm shaking and I'm trying to not make eye contact because I know if she looks at me, she's gonna go, you know, go get out of here. And um, some guy walks out of one of the other offices and standing next to me and I was looking down at my shoes because I didn't want to look at her. And I remember the guy had sneakers, jeans, white socks, and I figured, you know, another messenger guy, right? And so I'm standing there with my hand shaking and this guy next to me says, hey kid, what, what do you got there? And I said, and I looked up and the guy was like six foot three. Um, and I said, so, so my pictures. And he goes, can I see them? And I said, yeah, and I just gave him the pictures. And he said, these are really good. What are you doing here? And I said, you know, I said, I came all the way from my college. I was like almost in tears. And I said, I just wanted to show this John Lowengard guy some of my pictures and, and nobody will even like talk to me. And he goes, okay, calm down. He said, do you want me to go talk to John? And I said, oh. I thought he was a messenger like me. And I said, excuse me. He goes, my name is Gray Vallette. I'm the assistant director of photography here. Uh, but I, 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 you know, if you want, I'll go see if John can see you, but you know, we're pretty busy. I, and getting ready for this project we're doing. I said, that's why I'm here. And he said, well, just wait. Do you mind waiting a minute? It's like, do I mind waiting a minute? So he goes off and he comes back a few minutes later. This woman is now absolutely furious at me because I've done what she's paid never to allow happen. And he said, uh, I thought he was going to tell me John's too busy. And he said, look, I'm really sorry, but you know, John's really busy. And he said, he can see you in about an hour. Do you mind waiting? It's like, I'll sleep on the couch for the next week. I, I, I know I'm perfectly happy to wait. So I sat on the couch for about 45 minutes. And then this guy comes out of one of the offices and um, he says, hi, my name is John Lowengard. Uh, I'm coming to my office. And we go in there and he says, what do you got? And so I you know, handed him my yearbook. And I'm going, this is so stupid. I shouldn't have even brought the yearbook because it immediately says I'm a dork, you know, and, and I hand and I gave him the box of prints. And, you know, this guy has no expression on his face at all. Just looks at the yearbook, you know, goes to the prints and hands the back box back to me. And he says, uh, you know, nice work. What can I do for you? I said, you know, Mr. Longard, I, I read about this one day project that you're doing and I would just, you know, I, I, I'd love to work on it. He said, yeah, you know, we've already hired the 99 photographers. If you want to shoot some pictures in your college, uh, you know, we'll look at them. And I remember thinking, this is the only chance in my whole life I will ever have to be sitting in Life Magazine with the director of photography. And I said, um, listen, I don't want to be pushy. I, I like, I, you know, all I want to be is a photographer. And I, I just love Life Magazine. And if there's any possible way I could actually be one of the photographers and not just, you know, um, send you some stuff. And he just stared at me. It, it was probably 30 seconds, but it felt like five minutes. And he didn't blink. He just stared at me. And I was looking at his face thinking, I couldn't imagine what he was thinking. And then this little smile, I just remember this so distinctly, this little smile in the corner of his mouth. He goes, well, I guess it wouldn't financially bankrupt Time Life if we made it 100 photographers instead of 99. He said, um, all right, you're hired. And I have no memory of leaving his office. I have no memory how I got back to college. I had to pay my friend the $25. Um, and he said, so what's the assignment? And I said, oh, shit. I didn't, I, I was so freaked, I, I was so excited. I forgot to ask him what to shoot. So I, you know, called him and I said, I, I'm really sorry, maybe you told me. He said, no, no, I, I just said, take, you know, do what I said the first time, just show us what life is like at college today. So, you know, in the four days leading up to the shoot, um, I was so nervous. I kept thinking, you know, on Friday, it was, they, they shot on a Friday and they, I remember it like on Monday, I thought on Friday, I'm going to be shooting for Life Magazine and, and I couldn't sleep. I was like, what am I going to shoot? And, and what if I blow it? And, and the same thing that I've experienced like my whole career is, you know, this is so exciting. And then, oh shit, I'm this is going to be the end of my career. And by the time Friday came, I was a complete basket case. I literally hadn't slept for three days and, you know, nothing seemed to be, you know, I, all the pictures I was taking felt so flat and so dead. You know, you know, you know, 
you guys are all photographers, you know, when you're in flow and I was the opposite of flow, I was, nothing was working at all. And it was just, everything felt so boring. Um, at one point I was driving through Dickinson and I apparently ran a stop sign and a cop pulled me over. So I took a picture of him giving me the ticket, really uninteresting. And then I asked him if I could come back to the police station. Did he have anybody in jail? And there was somebody there with, who had been drunk or something the night before, and, but they wouldn't let me photograph him. So they let me take a, they let me take a picture of a plate of food they were putting like at the bottom of the door. Like, I guess they had a slit in the door or something and you could slide the, not that these were hardened criminals. So I took this really boring picture of this plate of food going into a prison door. Um, and you know, nothing was working at all. And then uh, towards the end, and then the end afternoon, there were a bunch of girls sitting in front of like the, the, the union building. And I took some pictures of them. One of the girls said, you know, what are you, why are you taking pictures? And I said, oh, I'm working for Life Magazine. You know, I was sort of full of myself. And they said, oh, that's so cool. Like, you know, why don't you come over to our house tonight? A bunch of us have a house off campus and you can tell us what it was like to work for Life Magazine. And one of the girls was kind of cute. So I said, you know, cool. So um, <laughs> I went to this house and, uh, you know, everybody was drinking and getting stoned, whatever. And uh, one of the girls said, um, <laughs> one of the girls said, we have a tradition in our house. Now I'm, I'm now 21 and these kids are like, 18, 19 years old. And one of the girls said, we have a tradition in our house, which is that when it's someone's birthday, we all take off our clothes, we go upstairs and take a shower together. I'm feeling really old because even though I'm, not, I'm just out of college, this was not going on when I was a freshman. Um, and one of the girls said, well, it's not your birthday, but in honor of you working for Life Magazine, we all talked about this earlier. And so we're gonna, do you wanna join us in the shower? So everybody goes into the shower and I took my Leica upstairs and I was, I, I took pictures because they have, you have to take your, take pictures of this. Well, Life Magazine will never realize this is going on in college. So I took the pictures fully realizing I was not going to send these to Life Magazine because there's no way they're going to publish naked pictures of teenagers in Life Magazine. So I took these pictures and in the middle of all this insanity, I said, are any of you actually a couple? And two of the Debbie and Bruce, uh, this one, these two people were a couple. So I said, can everybody else get out of the shower? And let me just take a picture of the two of you in the shower. So Bruce was soaping Debbie up. It wasn't pornographic, but they were obviously both naked. And um, and then the next day I was so hung over, the way that you ship film back then was there was a Greyhound bus terminal in town and you would actually take your film and, and, and it would go on the Greyhound bus underneath and you know now I think like this is so insane. Like all the things are going to happen to that film on the way. Anyway, I sent the film off, and about a day later, I said, "Oh my God, I, I, I included that role of film. They're going to think I'm some pervert or something." So I got a call from John Lowengard on on the next fr that Friday that week, and he goes, "Congratulations, you've got two pictures in the special issue." And I said, "Oh my God, that's great. What are the pictures you get?" Well, the first is this plate of food at the bottom of this prison door, and I'm thinking, "Oh my God, this is like the most uninteresting picture." in human history. And he said, the second one is this great picture of this couple taking a shower together in the morning before attending classes at Dickens and college. It was in the morning, right? Because we're going to use it as one of the opening pictures in the, in the issue. Absolutely. Take it in the morning. Absolutely. No question. <laughs> and then he said, and you, you got moderate releases, right? And I'm going, oh shit. Like there's no way in the light of day, they're going to sign a moderate release, right? So I went back to them literally with, with my heart in my mouth, trying to act very, you know, oh, this is so exciting, Bruce and Debbie. The life wants to use that picture, you guys, in the shower. Um, it's a little formality, uh, you know, would you mind? No problem, they signed it without a heartbeat. So the issue comes out about, you know, a month later, and the, fir the first call I got was my mother, who had uh, <laughs> bought every copy of Life Magazine in Cedar Grove, New Jersey. And she said, I love that picture of the plate of food. It's so, it's so artistical, you know, her, she called it artistical. Um, and the way the light was coming in on the, on the food and I'm, and I'm obviously hadn't seen the other picture yet. The, the second photograph was the uh, Dean of Admissions at Dickinson College who was getting calls from parents all over the country about their daughters naked in the shower, in, you know, living <laughs> off campus. And he said, do you realize what you've done to our uh, fundraising and admissions? In fact, I think it went up because every kid that saw it wanted to apply to Dickinson after that. Um, so that was my sort of first, uh, one of my first published photographs. 
with my friends in the shower at Dickinson uh, in, in Life magazine. And that just opened all kinds of doors. It was one of the pictures everyone talked about in all the reviews about, you know, just it was unlike anything that Life had ever published before. And it was a look at modern youth and you know, people, it was like a Rorschach test. Everybody projected all this stuff onto this completely random event that was taken in the morning at Dickinson College. So well, that was. So you mentioned story. Cedar Grove. Are you from New Jersey? Yeah, I grew up in Cedar Grove. Okay, I grew up in Elizabeth and Linden. Oh yeah. I grew, yeah, and I grew up in Livingston. Yep, Michael, see? you've never <laughs> grown up. <laughs> well, okay. I was ra I was raised in Livingston. Where in Cedar Grove did did you live? Uh, it was a called it was Ridge Road. Uh, there was a near, there was a near, place near the near near the uh, uh, reservoir. Yeah, 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 yeah. Just I went oh, I went no, to uh, to was it the, the high school the high school right across from the reservoir, or that elementary school elementary school. Can we uh, Google that that issue? Uh, I I don't I mean I I don't know if they ever published it. What what was funny is that years later, and in fact, it was the worst selling issue life ever did, which I'll probably take responsibility for. Uh, but um, uh, none of none of us met each other. None of the photographers met each other. We all worked separately. We all got assignments the way which is the way all magazines work. And years later, when I was in Australia and I I'd fallen in love with Australia. Um, you know, every time I ran into other photographers anywhere in the world, all they would do is bitch and moan. I mean, all of us would bitch and moan. I mean, I mean, they, I mean, we, everybody would just complain about, you know, we wanted our pictures to change the world. We wanted not just to document things, but we hoped that by shining a light on some unjust situation that people would be moved to do something about it. And so often, I think a lot of us felt like uh, the editors, you know, with all due respect to them back in New York or Paris or London or Tokyo, had a very clear mental picture of what they were looking for, and we were doing connect the dot photographs. You know, yeah, if your right. pictures showed something that the writers had mentioned or that didn't meet their preconceived uh, uh, idea of the story, um, you know, th those pictures would never see the light of day. And so we'd all sit around and bitch and moan about the pictures that that didn't get published. And um, I said, you know, wouldn't it be great if just like a whole bunch of us, like like this issue I worked on for life years ago when I was getting started, wouldn't it be cool if if I could invite my heroes, because uh, I was always like the baby of the group. I was always about 10 years younger than almost all the other photographers that I met around the world. Um, I was always uh, you know, astounded how generous people were to me. I was like the kid, you know, and everybody would say, you know, here's the home number of the American ambassador. If you're in this town and don't go to that border because they'll x-ray your film. And here's a great guide who can get you past all the guards into the palace. And I mean, even if I work for time and somebody else worked for Newsweek, and when we were shooting, it was every man and woman for themselves. I mean, everybody was very aggressive, but in the downtime, they were your family and your friends and they were the people, we all looked after each other. And it, again, because I was the baby, I just couldn't believe how generous people were. You know, like uh, Philip Jones Griffiths had this hotel room in Bangkok and he would just give keys to everybody because he was always, he, he basically kept the hotel room for four years. It was in the Trocadero Hotel. It probably cost him $15 a night. And anybody who was in town just stayed in his room. So you know, there were three beds and you'd always meet other photographers. And it was just so, and he would test, uh, Philip was, uh, had been a chemist. So he would actually buy hundreds of rolls of Kodachrome and then test it and then tell all of us, don't use that because it has a, a green bias or, you know, this film. And he, he was amazing. Uh, again, the sharing of information. Yeah. So sitting around in a bar with all these photographers, I said, wouldn't it be cool if like a hundred of us went to Australia where I had been working and we could, you know, take, we could show like a real, a real look at a country, not a preconceived, you know, the kangaroos and the koala bears and the opera house look. Um, and that's, so it was, it was funny. It was almost like, um, uh, you know, like the thing they say that uh, um, a duck or whatever is a duck, whatever a, a chicken sees first when it's born, it thinks it's his mother. Mom. And I kind of feel like that life assignment was like, you know, the, the same thing for me. I kept, I've been doing the same assignment yeah. now for- Do you, you, know, do you by days. chance have those photos available to show? I don't, I have another, I actually, um, I, you're right. That would, you know, John would be a really good thing to dig that picture <laughs> up. It wasn't the best picture in the world. I do have it somewhere, but um, if I can, uh, can I share my screen? Yeah, of course. So um, the very first assignment I ever did was for National Enquirer. Um, they <laughs> hired me to photograph two policemen who saw flying saucer land outside of um, Philadelphia. And um, these guys were so anxious to get their picture in the paper. And I love the guy with the chin strap on the right, which doesn't fit. <laughs> uh, they had an artist rendition of the flying saucer. 
And um, when I, you know, I was mentioning how shy I was when I was a kid. And um, when I was very young, I had this theory that I was actually an alien sent here to photograph, to observe life on earth and not interact because I literally couldn't talk to other people. And so it was very ironic that my first assignment was to photograph two people in Sina flying saucer land. Um, John, I don't know if you want me to do this, but I, I is this gonna work? Nope, does it work? Okay. Uh, does that, is that working? Yeah, now we see some time covers with you in the middle. Okay, so I, I yeah. <laughs> That was actually taken. That was taken by the Prime Minister of Australia. Um, I was in Japan, and I was assigned to spend uh, a week with him, photographing him, traveling around. Um, I was on way to China. He came to Japan on the way. Yeah, I, I heard that you had a trip to Japan on the first Pan Am nonstop. Yeah. Do Do you guys? So you were going for a day and ended up spending a year. Yeah. Uh, uh, there was a. I was part of a photo agency called Contact that is sort of was created in emulation of Magnum. And um, uh, I'm just gonna move this thing. It's so weird. I guess that's working. Um, uh, there were, uh, there were no, there, this Magnum sort of Contact was sort of like the United Nations of photography. We had an Israeli, an Italian, an Indian, a Canadian, several Americans. Um, and I, again, was the baby of the group. And so um, I was incredibly fortunate to be invited to join. Robert Pledge was the head of it. Um, I met David Burnett one day at Time Magazine sitting outside one of the editor's offices. And he told me they were forming a, this agency. And they were looking for a young photographer who would do all the assignments that nobody else wanted to do. Um, because inevitably, there were assignments that came in that just were not very interesting to most people. And I have said, you know, I'll do anything. I'm completely... I don't care what the assignment is because it'll always lead to something else. I had read very early on, there was a photographer named Elliot Irwitt, who uh, was the first photographer whose work I ever looked at. And um, I read that he always uh, kept a, a Leica on one shoulder to take his private personal pictures while he had all of his uh, other cameras on his other shoulder. And I sort of was inspired by that idea. So I thought, you know, it doesn't matter what the assignment is, I'll take anything because once I'm there, I'll shoot my own pictures. So, um, contact um, was given uh, a press junket uh, tickets from time to time. Uh, like, you know, and, and in this case, Pan Am had the first nonstop flight from New York to Tokyo. And uh, they gave the ticket to a photographer named Dirk Halstead, who was part of our group. He had, Dirk shot the most covers of Time Magazine in Time's history. Um, nobody wanted to do this assignment because it sounds like a free ticket to Japan. Why wouldn't you want that? But basically it was uh, fly to 18 hours to Tokyo, uh, take a picture of two guys shaking hands at Narita Airport, spend the night at a hotel at Narita Airport, get back on the plane and fly back to New York. So no one wanted to do that. Um, Dirk gave the ticket to David Burnett, who had brought me into contact in the first place. David also didn't want to do it. So David called me and said, have you ever been to Japan? I said, no, I'll go. And my intention was not to get on the plane back. I figured I'd spend a week there. Um, and as John said, I ended up spending 11 months um, that one ticket got me to Asia and I just fell in love with the whole idea of living, you know, in Asia. Um, Dirk Halstead also gave me a fantastic idea. Um, he actually came over to Asia on another assignment about three weeks after I got there. And he said, um, you should go to um, the hotel you're staying at, the KL Plaza in Tokyo, and offer to trade them uh, photographs of their hotel for free rooms, as long as you want to stay here. And I said, that'll work. They'll actually give me free rooms. He said, show them your covers of Time Magazine. People are so impressed. He said, those of us in the industry, you know, not, a, not that everybody has covers of Time, but all of my friends did. So for us, it was like, well, that's cool. But to somebody that not, wasn't a photographer, the fact you had a picture with your name inside on the cover of Time, the first thing they thought is, well, if we have this photographer here, somehow get us on the cover of Time, which was obviously crazy. So I went to the head of the KO Plaza, showed him some of my covers and he said, oh yeah, sure. We have, we have empty rooms. We'd love to, you can stay here as long as you want. And, you know, we'll give you rooms. We'll give you food. Just take lots of pictures of our hotel for, that we can use in brochures. And then Dirk also said, go to Cathay Pacific. Here's the name of the, I guess he was the head of publicity or marketing or something. And uh, to my astonishment, this wonderful guy who later became the head of Cathay Pacific um, actually offered me two free passes uh, anywhere I wanted to go in Asia, as long as I wanted to go anywhere in Cathay Pacific. 
And they often let me sit in the jump seat in these in the 747s. And this is how long ago this was. There's no security. I can give my ticket to somebody else. No one ever checked your name and your passport or anything. I, this is, I'm definitely dating myself here. Um, so I had this just unbelievable. It was it's a fantasy. I was 26 years old. Um, so I, I literally for five years, I lived in hotels and uh, and someone else, you know, paid to fly me around and feed me. And, and it's like, you know, it was I would pinch myself every day because, again, I kept thinking they're going to find out I don't know how to light. And then Doug Kirkland would sit down and spend like two days teaching me how to light. Um, the generosity of other photographers and that sense of family um, was something that, you know, I, I just I still completely cherish. And, it, and in some ways it led to that idea of the day in life books because it was like getting this whole family of people, you know, every time there's a plane crash or a pope visit or a, a typhoon or whatever, all generally the same men and women would descend on these things. And so you start you're meeting the same people at different places and hanging out with them. So we all started to get to know each other. And um, there's a lot of jealousy, but there's a lot of you know friendship and sharing too. So it was pretty exciting. Did you photograph any plane crashes? I did not. Um, That's good. I, a, fr a friend of mine, um, there was a young woman who was a Pan Am stewardess um, and um, one of the things that I also learned early on, and this again is going to sound so incredibly old fashioned now, but we would literally go to the airport and try to find a stewardess and ask her to carry our film back to New York City. Uh, and we would have Richie, the, ta the taxi driver, our, our, we, there was a taxi driver we became friends with, and he used to pick us up at the airport. And he would drive out there, meet the stewardess, get our film and take it to Time or Newsweek or US News and World Report. Um, and because if you shipped it, it took three days through a courier service, which because it had to go through customs, all this other stuff. So uh, we, we had this whole network of, of stewardesses um, that were girlfriends and couriers um, uh, for us that, that and, and the, we, would, we all knew the girls so that, again, it was this almost shadowed network behind the photographers uh, of friendships and, and camaraderie that was just, you know, some, it's like, I keep thinking somebody should do like a Mad Men kind of TV series about this world of these photographers that don't live anywhere, terrible at relationships. I mean, every one of my friends, for the most part, men and women, I mean, you can imagine it was so hard to, to maintain any kind of relationship. And um, uh, there's, a, there's a great expression, which I'm sure you've all heard, which is that you know, photojournalism is the world's finest form of delayed adolescence. Huh. Um, so you know, at 26, I was about 18 emotionally. You know, every girlfriend I had lasted two weeks and then I'd get an assignment and, and it's like, you know, we'll work this out when I get back. And of course, I would never come back because I'd go off to some other country. So I never really grew up for, you know, I was emotionally, I was very immature, um, which, you know, as a photographer, maybe that's an advantage. Well, you've been married um, for a while now, correct? Yeah, about, oh gosh, 30 years now. Um, and very happily. And to Elliot Irwin's daughter, the first Book I ever saw of any photographer. I kept trying to meet him, and uh, every young photographer wanted to show their work to Elliot Erwitt. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I, I once finally, when I was about, I was about twenty three or twenty four, got an, an appointment to meet him at Magnum. And um, again, I took my box of prints, and I was like so in awe of this guy. And I handed him the box of prints, and he just went through them. And mm, that's amusing. Hmm, interesting. Hmm, nice. Thank you for coming. That, that was the entire meeting. I remember he said like four words. If any of you know Elliot, he's a man of very few words. Very few words. Just... I know I've read articles, interviews with him that get like one question and it's over. Yeah, but he's very funny too. He's not yes. rude. He's just quite reserved. And uh, but when he does talk, he, his, he talk, he, he's as funny in person as his pictures are. What I, what I loved about Elliot's pictures were one, that he was shooting them for himself and two, that um, they were funny without making fun of people. Um, they just had this wonderful sort of, you know, whimsical um, quality to them. Um, yeah, I mean, I first learned about it, Elliot, from this book. I don't remember if you remember this yeah, series. That, that, yeah, I love that. That's by Larry Schiller and Sean Callahan. Yeah. I, I give that to everybody. You know, the book, that's probably 1974, 73. Yeah, look in here, see if it... Show the one of the uh, yes, 74. The dog, the dog feet. The dog feet, yeah, that's the, one of his most famous pictures. Famous picture. 
Yeah, I'd have yeah. to look through here to to find it. And the the kid with the the baguette on his back yeah. in France. Yeah, in France. You know uh, that book that that he uh, Sean did that whole series, and then he launched American Photo Magazine. So that was sort of the precursor to American Photo Magazine. Yeah, that was with Petersons back then. Exactly. It was a, and Larry it was a great Schiller, series. Who, I, I've got all of them yeah. here. I was a kid. I was a voracious reader of photography. What what, what was really unusual about that series, John, is that it um, it showed the greatest hits, but it also talked about the personal lives, about the mm -hmm. technical side of the photographer. So you got this sort of three dimensional portrait of the photographer, not just you hear these beautiful pictures, but sort of backstory. Um, one of my favorite uh, um, stories of Elliot in that book was that he was uh, assigned to photograph the Pope. And he went into St. Patrick's Cathedral and had forgotten to bring a flash. And it was incredibly dark. And it was, I was shooting for life or somebody. And it so reminds me a little bit of my story of you know conning my way into that life. But um, he was pretty freaked out because even pushing uh, Kodak, you know, Triax to like 1600 or something, he realized everything was going to be a blur. And he had this brainstorm um, because as the Pope moved through the crowd and they were, I guess he was up on, on something, they were carrying him through this, this crowd, um, you know, different people were shooting flashes off. So he basically um, set right. his camera at F8 and opened the shutter and just held the camera up at each flash. Illustrate, uh, uh, he used the other people's flashes mm -hmm. to illustrate the Pope going through the crowd who appeared like five times in this picture. It was just, I remember reading that thinking, talk about lemons to lemonade, right? And it became like a classic photograph, but it was so perfect, Elliot, because out of desperation, he'd completely innovated. I just, that, that creativity was just extraordinary. Um, Elliot's now 92. Yeah. Um, on my 33rd birthday, I was invited to um, an exhibit by Hiroji Kubota, a wonderful photographer, also with Magnum. And I went to this exhibit, and there was Elliot um, with his... Uh, I guess it was his third wife, third or fourth wife. I think he's had five wives now. And um, I went over to, you know, I figured he's not going to remember me, but I, can't, I went over to pay homage to the master. And, you know, of course, said hello. And I don't know if you remember me. We met a couple of years ago. You looked at my pictures. He goes, nice to, nice to see you. And this beautiful young 23-year-old girl was standing next to him. And I was thinking, you know, girlfriend, wife, you can never tell with photographers, you know, 30 years younger. Uh, but it turned out it was, it was his daughter, and uh, I spoke with her for a few minutes and told my best friend I met the woman I was going to marry that night, and uh, that was that was almost uh, 38 years ago. It took seven years to talk her into it. <laughs> it was a very long courtship, but uh, we're now partners on these projects. There she is. <laughs> nice shot. That was from a couple of years ago at the EG conference, yeah. and let's see if I have the other one here. <laughs> that's the last time I saw Rick. <laughs> nice shot, John. I, I, I'm so, I never see myself without my glasses. <clears throat> I didn't get much sleep that night. Um, yeah, it's, I, you know, I still, um, I went from being a photographer. I, I, you know, I love being a photographer. I love that, <clears throat> you know, you talk to um, athletes or musicians, uh, and everybody talks about you know runners high or uh, that you know that feeling when you're in flow you know that 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 magical feeling where you're no longer even aware of yourself and I, I love I loved being a, a photographer on the road where I'd wake up in the morning and I'd have you know four, thirty or forty rolls of film that I'd stick into my dom key bag and thinking tonight when I come back these thirty rolls of film will be full of something but if I make a left out of my hotel instead of a right all these pictures will change. And then I'd come back at the end of the day and I literally, it was like, I, I, the first hour, so I'd be self-conscious and then I'd not remember what happened for the last seven hours. It was like, the, you, you sort of, you're doing it, but you're not thinking about what you're doing while you're doing it. I don't know if I'm describing that very well, but um, that feeling of, of when you're in flow and you're shooting was just so addictive. So when I started doing these projects, um, I missed, the spontaneity, the fact that now when I do projects and I'm, you know, basically I've now become the evil editor that I used to hate when I was a young photographer. Um, uh, you know, now I'm the person that's choosing the wrong picture and, and doing something wrong. But um, 
at a certain point, I think I realized as a photographer that I could never control the outcome that I was always, no matter how good a photographer I may have been or, or could become, that I was always a cog in somebody else's machine. And um, I had no intention of giving up photography. I was going to do this one book on Australia. It was sort of a wacky idea. And then I'd go back to shooting again. And, um, uh, you know, it, I don't, John, do you want me to sort of shoot, uh, share the origins of, of sort of how the day in life books sure. happen and almost yeah. didn't happen? Oh, yeah. So uh, just keep going. Hang on one second. Michael had a question for you. All right, okay. So, oh, uh, uh, um, what year did you fly to Tokyo on Pan Am? 1976, April. Uh, 1976. Oh, I missed yeah. you by I I missed you by one year. I was staff photographer with Pan Am from 69 oh. to 74, and oh I, I I too stayed at the KO Plaza because <laughs> Pan American World Airways owned the Intercontinental Hotel System, which is the KO Plaza was part of. Yeah, I, I love that hotel. I literally spent months living there. Um, it was just it was just it was wonderful. I mean, talk about the day, good old days, right? And also, you know, um, I, I, you know, again, I, I thought Australia was such an interesting place because it was before the film industry. Um, when the prime minister, I spent a week traveling with the prime minister of Time Magazine, and um, at one point we toured the Nikon camera factory, and then we took a bullet train from Tokyo to Kyoto in the afternoon. And you know, the, I was with the press guys in the back of the train. And one of the Secret Service people for the Prime Minister came to the back of the press car and he said, where's the American kid? And as you saw, I had hair down to here. <laughs> and he said, the, the Prime Minister wants to see you right now. And all my Australian friends, because by then the other journalists had become friends, said, oh, you're in big trouble now, mate. When the Secret Service comes to get you, you really screwed up. So I'm like, oh, shit, what did I do? And they escort me to the front of the train and there's this private compartment and they opened the door and they put me in, closed the door and I'm sitting there and there's the prime minister and I'm like, you know, trying to breathe normally. And he says, uh, so do you prefer the 24 Nikkor or the 35? And he just wanted to talk. He, he said, I'm like an avid amateur photographer and I was watching you today and the other guys are all shooting Canon and I was watching you, you know, you know, you, you like prime lenses better than zoom lenses. And, and he just wanted to talk shop. And he said, you know, um, he started, you know, he said, um, Oh, he said the most interesting thing. He said, can I ask you a personal question? I said, sure. Um, he said, do you ever have two days that are the same? I said, what do you mean? He said, when I wake up on Monday morning, they hand me a piece of paper and it tells me every moment of my week is prescribed. At 10 a.m. on Tuesday, you will meet with the head of state. You're gonna... He said, you know, I'm so jealous of your, the fact that, you're, that life just unfolds for you spontaneously. I mean, here's the prime minister of Australia being jealous of me. I'm this 26 year old, like hippie kid. I literally had love beads and like a leather band on my arm. And he said, you know, have you ever been to Australia? And I said, oh God, no, I'd love to go to Australia. I, you know, I've read about it. And he goes, well, you know, we have a program where we bring six journalists a year. We, it's all expenses paid. We fly you down there, you, you tour the country, it's hotels, cars, you know. I said, why? And he goes, well, because we're so far away. We just want people to know that we're there and that we're, you know, we're not just like, you know, the prisoners that were stuck at the bottom of the world. He said, would you like to be our guest? And, it, and like, I'm looking around, around for Alan Funt. Like, it's this candid camera. Like, you got to be kidding me. Um, and so, um, you know, I went from this free Pan Am ticket to traveling with the prime minister to now I'm on my way to Australia. And um, I get to Australia. Time, of course, is ecstatic because, you know, when a photographer gets an in like that with a politician, it's like gold. Um, so I toured the country. Time said, oh, you're in Australia now. Um, we just had a writer, Roy Rowan, who just wrote this whole story about how terribly the Australian government uh, treats Aborigines. Um, would, you, would you be available to fly to the outback and photograph uh, the cover story uh, to accompany his pre-written story? I said, yeah, of course. So I go to the out and the writer Roy had said to me, there was this wonderful young woman who'd been a, a social worker who had taken him into the Aboriginal camps to get permission and, you know, sort of guide him. So he, I called this woman and she said, meet me, come out and stay at this hotel, make a right, walk down the hotel. There's a pub. I'll meet you at the pub at three o'clock you know, next Tuesday. So I fly to Alice Springs. I have a terrible sense of direction. Instead of making a right out of the hotel to walk down the 
straight to the pub. I made a left. Got well, you're on. You're down under anyway. Right and left are switched. Yeah, exactly. The <laughs> toilets when you flush, they actually go in the other yeah. direction, which is true, actually. Um, <laughs> that's one of those things you can share at a cocktail party. Um, anyway, I, I make a left, and the most beautiful woman I'd ever seen in my life is washing the windows of my hotel. What happened and to your she, wife? Oh, well, I was married. I wasn't married. This is when I was 20. I met my wife when I was 33. I was 20, still 26 at this point. Just so I, um, yeah, thank you, Paul. <laughs> uh, I, um, I, um, uh, this girl, blonde hair, blue eyes and wearing this tight sarong and, you know, the hair lit from behind, you know, and I had three cameras around my neck. And so I got over my shyness and had a long lens and took two pictures of her and she started yelling at me. Wait, if you go back, if you share the screen again, second, let me jump to that. Anyway, um, so I took a picture of her. She started yelling at me. Uh, I Somebody told me years ago, one of my photographer friends said, um, you know, if somebody gets angry at you when you're photographing, always go over and explain what you're doing. Because usually when you take, when people get angry, they usually think you're making fun of them. Yeah, you know, usually it's, it's a, you know, when people get angry, they usually think you've done or taken something from them. So I walked over and said, I'm really sorry. I didn't mean to get you upset. I, I'm a I'm a journalist, and and she said, "Oh, you're American." And you know, in Australia, you know, my father, my father, and a lot of other people's fathers in World War II fought with Australians and fought together with Australians, and so there was this real camaraderie between Americans and Australians. And so, I always found that the moment I told people I was American in Australia, it was like, "Oh my God, this is so great," you know. But so I, she said, "Oh, you're American," and I thought she was about to say something nice, and she said, "You know." you goddamn parasites come down here. You're, you're, you're here to photograph Aborigines. Like you, people come in here, you take advantage of these poor people, you make all this money and you know, you're just all, you goddamn parasites, get the hell out of here. And I, I couldn't calm her down at all. So I, I left, <clears throat> I, I went, finally went down the street, met the woman, the social worker I was supposed to have met in the first place. She took me to the camp, so I got permission. Um, and then at the end of the day, she said, what are you doing for dinner tonight? I said, I'm going to go back to my hotel room and, you know, label my roles of film and work on captions. And she said, well, a group of us that work with Aborigines are having a dinner party and, you know, you might want to come because they might have some of their ideas of things you might want to shoot while you're here in town. Um, so I said, great. And she gives me this address and I drive to this address at the end of the day. And it's this abandoned looking building. The walls are caved in, There's the, the, the roof is caved in. And I think I've gotten lost again, my great sense of direction. And, uh, but there's cars and I hear music. So I walk up to the door and I knock on the door just, you know, kind of making sure whether this is the right place or not. And of course, who answers the door, but the woman who had been washing the windows of my hotel, she was not at all happy to see me. What the hell are you doing here? I said, uh, your friend invited me to a dinner party. And she said, well, put your cameras down. You can't photograph my friends. And I said, okay. Uh, and so I walk in and there's no back to the house. Literally the house was like this disintegrated house with it. She had a sleeping bag in the corner and her friends were all there and everybody's eating and smoking. And um, in the backyard, she has camels tied up. And I said, why do you have camels? And she says, none of your goddamn business. <laughs> so I went to the girl that I was the social worker. I said, what's with your friend? Like, you know, first of all, I didn't know that was her. And secondly, I didn't kill her dog. I took a picture of her and she said, oh, Robin's this strange girl that showed up here about a year ago. And she, she's been you know, camping here at night and um, she's washing windows. I said, yeah, that's, I saw her earlier today. And I said, well, what's with the camels? And she said, well, she's got this crazy idea. She's going to walk 2000 miles through the desert, through the outback from here out to the Indian Ocean, which is like 2000 miles. Um, I said, why? And she says, we don't know. Um, we bring her food and music and she's kind of, you know, in a really interesting person, but we're worried she's gonna die out there. And we've told her we wanna go with her, but she won't let anybody else come. She wants to do this all by herself. And I said, wow, it's like wacky. And then I didn't, you know, think about it again. I went off and we worked all week. And the day I was leaving, the, my, the, the social worker said, oh, before you go, do you remember the girl with the camels? And I said, yeah, a little hard to forget. And she said, well, she wants to ask you a favor. I'm starting to think, well, what possible favor could this woman ask me? I mean, she wants a copy of my picture that she hated me taking. And she said, no, Robin wrote to National Geographic magazine um, a year ago when she first got here, seeing if they would give her money for her trip. And um, they never answered. And she thought, you know, do you know somebody that works there? Could you use your name or something? And I said, you know, I've been to workshops. I, I've met some of the editors. I don't know if they even remember me, but yeah, tell her she can use my name for what it's worth. 
And then this is now 11 months I've been away from this one week ticket from Pan Am. So I went back to New York and sleeping on my sister's couch. I had no apartment at that point. And the phone rings about three days after I'm back and it's Bob Gilka from National Geographic. And he said, um, I don't know if you remember me, we met at the Southern Workshop, Southern Short Course Workshop there a year ago. And I said, of course, it, it, you know, wow. What can I do for you? He goes, well, we, I totally forgotten yet, even given my name to this girl. And, and he said, well, we got this letter from this woman who wants to do this trip and we're thinking of funding it. Is she a nutcase or is she for real? Because, you know, we don't want the headline National Geographic score dies in week two, you know. I said, well, um, I was trying to be polite. I said, well, she's very intense. Um, she's very focused. I've seen her camels. Uh, I've seen her maps. Um, uh, I understand she's been, you know, working really hard to earn money for her trip. I was just trying to, you know, say nice things. And he said, well, since you guys are such good friends, would you like to be the photographer that we hire to follow her, you know, on and off during the year, you're going to have to go out and find her five times in the desert. You're, you're so an outback kind of guy, right? I mean, you're like, you know, outward bound, blah, blah, blah. It's like, I wasn't even a boy scout. It's like, oh yes, absolutely. I am there. I have no problem surviving in, in the desert. So now I'm on this insane adventure with this woman who the moment I show up, she, she hates me. I mean, she's just, I want to be alone. What are you doing here? I said, you wrote to the geographic and asked them for funding and, you know, they sent me to photograph you. And she said, well, I thought I was going to take the pictures. I said, no, you are the story. And she, and she said, well, no, I, I don't want you coming. I don't want you coming. I, I, I'm, I don't even want my friends to come. I don't want some parasite. And I said, okay, wait, give them back their money. I'll go home. Well, I can't, I can't wait. I can't like, I can't wait on assholes in pubs anymore and wash any more windows. I guess I'm stuck with you. It's like, oh, you're welcome. Uh, <laughs> So I had the most unbelievable adventure. I mean, of course, I fell madly in love with this woman because she hated me. Um, and uh, I had the most interesting conversations with her. I mean, you know, like the, the first, I had to find her five times during this, this, she was out there for nine months. She got lost. She was attacked by herds of wild camels. She ran out of water. The Aborigines adopted her. Um, at one point, uh, the media found out she was doing this trip and made up a story that she was lost. And there were 100 people out there with helicopters and trackers trying to find her. And I thought she had died. Every time I left her, I was worried I'd never see her again. Um, the, the, uh, again, John, I don't know how much you want me to go into this, but you know, on one of the first trips out there, she looked at me and said, you, know, you Americans treat friendship like Valium. Like she was always like insulting me or poking me. And I said, okay, what does that mean? She said, well, every time I see Americans together, you're all saying, don't worry, it'll be fine. Everything will work out. I said, that's a bad thing. She goes, yeah, because in Australia, if someone's your mate, someone you care about, if someone's your friend and they're doing something stupid, they're marrying the wrong person, they're doing drugs, they're screwing their lives up, you take a stick and you hit them over the head with it. It's like, you, you're you all cowards. Like you you don't want to, you want to risk your friendship by actually being a friend and risk, you know, it, it was like somebody going like that to me. It was like, Oh, that's really interesting. I mean, I didn't always agree with her, but um, she had so many um, things like that, which made me think. Um, one day I showed up um, on like the third time I was out there and, you know, I just finished shooting a cover story for time in Taiwan. You know, I'd, I'd leave her and then go off and do other assignments. And so I, I, I you know, it was the Aborigines always knew where she was. Even if she'd say, I haven't seen anybody in a month, if I could find an Aboriginal uh, settlement and I'd say the camel lady, they would always know exactly where she was. And you know, when I, when I would leave, um, we'd always say, okay, you're walking 20 miles a day. So if I come back in four weeks, you're probably gonna be about to, near this Aboriginal settlement or this you know, cattle station or whatever. So I had a rough idea of where she would be, but it never took me more than 24 hours ever to actually find her. So I show up. And I'm blathering on about, I hope my film you know, from Taiwan didn't get x-rayed. And like, when I leave you in a week, I'm going to drive ahead to that cattle station, leave my car there. And I, I better make sure there's, you know, water. And she suddenly stops and she looks at me. I'm sitting on one side of the campfire. She's sitting on the other. And she goes, um, when are you going to get here? I said, you mean next time when I come out? She goes, no, when are you going to get here? And I said, what are you talking about? And she goes, when are you going to get here? I said, oh, you know, I thought, you know, I always thought she was a little nuts to begin with. And I thought, oh my God, like she's been alone now for six weeks and she's lost it. I said, Robin, I I'm here now. I mean, I'm, you're on that side of the campfire and I'm sitting on this side. She says, you know what? You tell me how much you want to spend time with me and how much you want to be out here with me. And you come here and all you do is talk about where you were or where you're going. You're never here. 
It's like you spend your whole time either worrying about something you already did or something you're going to do, but you're never actually present. And it's like, again, same thing. It's like, whoa, it's like, you're right. I mean, and how many of us spend our lives like either regretting or planning and never actually being present in the moment? And, and my whole, I spent actually three months traveling with her and it was literally my year of growing up, of, of stopping being a boy and learning how to be like you know, an adult. Um, and- It was um, hitting on you. <laughs> you know, it, it was just, you know, I, Every relationship, as I said, that it, it ever got complicated, I just left. I never worked through anything with, with a girlfriend ever because I didn't have to. <laughs> and this time I had to come back because it was my job. But I also, but the other thing that was really challenging is that Robin refused to wear clothes a lot. And so um, I didn't want to send pictures of her naked back to National Geographic because I was in love with her. And I also didn't want them to think what was going on was going on. So. Um, if you work for the geographic, you're not allowed to edit your own film. That's like rule number one is you send all your film back to Washington and they edit it because most photographers are terrible editors of their own work. And, and I know this now having now that I've been on the other side of the fence. So, you know, usually the photographers, as you all know, the one that the, the, the image that was the hardest to take is the one you love the most. And sometimes it's, it's the frame 36 by accident that turns out to be the best picture. So, um, I would take my film back to Sydney or um, uh, Melbourne and develop it at the local Kodak labs, edit it and only show them what I wanted them to see. And they were just furious. It's like, you broke your contract, we're, you know, you're never gonna work for us again. And they threatened me and I would just ignore it. Just my loyalties were not to my career. They were not to National Geographic. They were completely to her. And all I wanted to do was, you know, kind of, you know, prove to myself that I was not a parasite, you know, blah, blah, blah. So it, it's actually at the end of the trip, she survived um, lots of stories along the way. And, and towards the end of the trip, we're sitting down and again, always around a campfire. And she says, so I have a question for you. And I said, yeah. She said, so when this trip is over, are you going back to being a prostitute? And it's like, seriously, you're still doing this nine months into this and you're still like poking me. And she said, no, no, I mean that in a good way. I said, okay what part of calling me a prostitute is good? And she said, Rick, until, until my trip, somebody would say, care about this subject for a week, they would pay you money, and then you would care about something else. That's sort of the definition of being a prostitute, right? I said, I guess. And she said, look, my point is that, she said, I, you've now won me over that you're a great photographer. And my question is, are you going to wait for somebody else to wind you up and tell you what to care about, or are you going to find things where you can use your skill as a photographer to actually change the situation, which is, of course, what we all want as photographers to change the situation. So um, it was a little bit like, you know, go cut off the head of the dragon and you can win the hand of the princess. So uh, about a, a, a two months after the camel trip was over, Time sent me to do a story about uh, children who've been fathered by American GIs in Asia. And I found out there were 40,000 children all over Southeast Asia, everywhere where we had troops. And this is not just Americans. Every time there's been any, you know, anytime there's a, there, there's a large group a contingent of any country's, you know, soldiers in any country, they're gonna be, you know, kids that result from this. But it, it was a really horrible situation, which is that the local governments would say, these are the children of GIs. And because of the racial mixes, the more the kids looked American or Western, the more prejudiced and beaten up and taunted and ridiculed and nobody wanted to marry them, nobody wanted to hire them. And they were really delegated to the, the, to the bottom of society. And um, I did the story and I was just so disturbed by what I saw. And the US government said, these are the children of prostitutes, even if the women weren't prostitutes. And so the kids were lost in this limbo. In some countries, they wouldn't even give them passports. They wouldn't give them citizenship. Uh, so I had this, I had this crazy idea, which is I was gonna, you know, part of it was proving myself to Robin, and part of it was, you know, being inspired by her. And so I had this idea that I, I basically found six children in different countries, and I spent six months traveling from one kid to the other. And I was gonna, I had this mental picture. I was gonna do this story. It was gonna be, I was gonna try to pitch it to the New York Times or Time Magazine, and give a copy to every member of Congress in the Senate, and you know, shock people and shine a light on this horrible situation. I never heard the word Amerasian before, even the forty thousand children, but it was not a a phrase I'd ever even heard. And so um, I'm going to try to go back, if I can, John, to the presentation here. Yeah, you can go back okay. and 
while you're doing that, I should mention that there is a movie called Tracks. Oh, yeah. Actually, I can let me go to that for a second. Um, yeah. We're seeing so, National Geographic, National Geographic Extra. Yeah. Good. Okay. So not only did Robin's story appear on the cover of National Geographic, it was a 30 page cover story. They completely forgot they were angry at me because the story was such an enormous success. Um, but then it ran all over the world. I even found publications in Bangkok that had stolen the pictures, really photographed them out of the geographic and put them in their own magazines. It was totally weird. Um, and uh, this is the actress on the right who, uh, oh, so, so for years I kept getting calls from Hollywood, but uh, I'm gonna back up for a second. I kept telling Robin she should keep a journal because someday she might wanna write a book about it. And of course her response was, why do you have to turn everything into a product? Why can't you just experience things and not be marketing it and yeah. thinking about how to sell it and promote it? And I said, okay, well, someday you might want to write a book. No, I'm not going to ever write a book. So two years after the trip is over, she calls me up and says, you're not going to believe this, but I've written a book. And I said, about what? She goes, about the trip. And she said, I'm not very nice to you in it. And I said, okay. She said, I want you to read it before it's published. So I read it. You know, I'm an asshole at the beginning of the book. And then I get to be better by the end of the book. So I, I said, you don't have to change anything. She said, you said, you're sure you're okay with it? I said, I think readers will understand your perspective of whose eyes they're looking through. I, I think I'm okay by the end of the book. So for years, um, her, her book actually sold 1.4 million copies in, uh, in like 18 languages. It's required reading in wow. high schools now. It's like, remember Catch in the Rye when we were growing up? Mm -hmm. So Trax is, cat, Trax is the Australian Catcher in the Rye down there. So every four or five years, I get a call from somebody in Hollywood saying, we're doing the movie. First, Diane Keaton tried buying the rights. Yes, Michael. I have a question for you. So, um, did you ever resolve what her problem was? Or if she had a problem, and maybe it was you that had the problem, what, what, what was it? Um, you know, Robin is more comfortable, I think, with animals than she is with people. Yeah. Um, and, and, uh, What's the difference? <laughs> <laughs> I think animals are nicer. They're less complicated. You don't have to wonder if your dog loves you or not. You know, right? There's no subterfuge with animals, whether they yeah. actually yeah. adore you or not. Um, with people, it's a little more complicated. Um, so, I mean, one what of the things interesting now? is um, she, after the, uh, about my gift to Robin at the end of the camel trip, She'd never been out of Australia before. And so I bought her a ticket to London because she, she made me read every book written by Doris Lessing, uh, a very strong feminist writer um, who, whose books I actually love, but books I would have never read. And uh, again, it was part of my year of growing up. And I kept saying to her, do you realize at the end of this trip, anyone you want to meet in the world will want to meet you? And she said, what are you talking about? I'm some girl covered with camel dung. Why would anybody find this interesting? And I said, you have no idea. Um, so um, I uh, used to pick up her mail uh, first in, in, in like I, I'd fly to Perth and then, and then get a small private plane and fly to the Outback to find her. And one day I picked up her mail in Perth. It, she would you know, write, it, she had like a mailbox at a local post office there that we set up and it said D. Lessing, Laura, London, England. And I, I said, what is this? And she goes, well, you said anybody I wanted to meet would want to meet me. So I wrote to Doris Lessing. And the letter, Doris said, I've been reading about you in the British press. You know, they said you were lost, you died in the outback. They made up all these stories. And she said, if you ever come to England, I would, be, I would love to you know, have tea with you. So um, I bought Robin a ticket to London to meet Doris Lessing. And um, she was there for about a month and she called me and she said, I have good news and bad news. And I said, what's the good news? She said, well, the good news is I, I got along great with Doris and she's actually invited me to stay in London and, and rent her basement flat to, um, to write a book about tracks, which is where the book is written. And I said, what's the bad news? And she said, well, every Friday, uh, Doris has a writer's salon where she invites writers from all over London to come and uh, meet each other. And I've met this guy named Salman Rushdie and I've sort of fallen in love with him and I, I'm not coming back. And uh, Robin is the blonde reporter in Satanic Verses. He based the whole character on her. Um, wow. Remember the, the book that he was condemned to death for by the Ayatollah? Right. Um, so I was heartbroken um, and uh, incredibly depressed for quite a while. 
but anyway, for, for, for years, um, they've been trying to make a movie out of this, as I said. So Diane Keaton tried, Diane Keaton tried buying it. That didn't work. Uh, then, um, let's see, it was going to be, uh, oh, Julia Roberts was cast as Robin. And uh, that didn't happen. And then uh, Helen Hunt, who I actually met with, who was really delightful. And uh, she and uh, Kevin Spacey were together in Hawaii. And I saw them in the lobby of a hotel and went over to introduce myself. And at first I got the reaction you always get from movie stars. It's like, oh, go away, leave me alone. I'm just here on vacation. And then, and then when I sort of explained who I was, Helen was incredibly sweet and said, oh my God, this is the, this is the guy who took those pictures. You know that book next to my bed? This is the woman I'm going to play in that movie. And of course the movie never happened. So uh, then it was Nicole Kidman. That never happened. I never met Nicole Kidman. And then about five years ago, I got a call from this guy, uh, an Australian guy on the phone. And he said, hi, is Rick Small in there? I said, yeah. And he said, um, my name is Emil Sherman and I'm the, uh, the producer of the King's Speech. And I said, oh my God, how nice to meet you. What can I do for you? He goes, you know, we're, we're doing tracks, we're doing the movie. And I said, you know, no offense, but this is now the fifth conversation I've had with somebody from Hollywood. And I, I really don't have, I can't do this again. Every single time they wanted advice, they wanted meetings, all this stuff. And he said, no, no, we've raised the money. We've, we've cast, um, we've cast um, uh, uh, Mia Wasikowska, this wonderful young Australian act actress. And we've cast this guy, Adam Driver, to play you. And I had no idea who that was. He was in Girls at the time. It was way before he was Kylo Ren in Star Wars. And, um, and uh, he said, and Adam lives in New York and would like to meet you because he doesn't know how to hold a camera. He knows nothing about photography. And he wants to, he doesn't want to, you know. Anyway, so I, I, Adam was delightful. This is, again, before his star. I mean, now he's like one of the top actors in the world. This was, you know, five or six years ago. Um, but, you know, I had, so David Burnett actually spent a day, I was in the middle of doing a huge project, so I actually couldn't spend the time with him, but David Burnett, talk about full circle after giving me the ticket to Japan, David spent the day uh, with Adam, showing him how to hold the camera load film. Adam said, I, uh, I take pictures with my iPhone. He said, I have no idea how to, how to hold a camera. At, and, <laughs> and then um, a, young, a young photographer uh, named Josh Hayner who had worked for me as an intern when he was 16 and, and won the Pulitzer Prize a few years ago, also spent a day with Adam. Um, and then they actually offered to fly me back to Australia, Robin and me, both to be on the set when they were filming the movie, which was, I can't tell you how surreal that was to watch these two young, wonderful actors literally wearing our clothes. Let me see if I can go to the next slide here. Um, well, that, that's the poster for the movie. Um, it was a beautiful film. It was. It's now still one of the ten top indie movies on uh, Amazon Prime right now. Um, yep. Yeah. So anyway, that, so that the movie did really well. Um, Robin, you asked uh, Michael, I think, where Robin is now. She um, lives. Um, she lived in India for fifteen years with an Indian prince, and she's moved back to Australia about three years ago and lives south of Melbourne now. And she just finished writing a memoir. She's actually become one of Australia's most beloved writers. She's got wow. seven books out now. Rick, so, Rick where, where did she get her education? Because she seems incredibly uh, um, educated and, and intuitive. Uh, you know, there's some people you meet who seem to have been here before. Um, you know, uh, I, I was 26, 27 on the trip. She was 26, but th this is like somebody who had a wisdom and a, a perspective on life that was so different than anybody I met, but also they're like, you know, just sort of a basic wisdom that I don't know where, you know, she went to, to uni university in Brisbane, studied Japanese and philosophy, I think, but just really extraordinary. I mean, I would have thought she grew up on a cattle station or something, but she said before Alice Springs, she didn't know how to hammer a nail or, or tie a knot. She said she was as clueless as I was when I showed up and she'd spent two years learning did she, and preparing. Did she ever come to the United States? Yeah. You know, can you imagine uh, nine months in the outback alone? Suddenly you're at National Geographic with these guys in suits clinking champagne glasses. Um, it was very strange. The whole experience, talk about culture shock. Um, but and then as she, years later, she came and, and, and she lived in New York for, I think, a year and a half, two years. Um, spent, lived in London for a couple of years and then spent most of her life in India, actually. She did another camel trip for National Geographic. Uh, Delete Mehta was the photographer on that. She invited me, but I kind of felt like I survived the first one. And by then I was married and just, you know, for a million reasons, I, I kind of felt like I actually 
you know, managed to stay, I managed to survive her and I survived the desert the first time. And uh, we're, we're really good friends, but I didn't want to, I didn't, I, uh, that was, you know, my head was someplace else at that point. This is a so. brilliant story. This, this entire, uh, it's the story behind the story. It's brilliant. Uh, just, I, I feel so fortunate to have met her. And you, you, I, I think all of us on this call, you can think of all these times in your life where something apparently random, seemingly unimportant at the moment, you look back and that was like, as Andy Grove says, the inflection point, like your whole life changed simply because you made a right instead of a left. Do you, you, ever, think, oh check the, do you ever check the bottom of your shoes? Because you seem to step in some <laughs> really good stuff. <laughs> Yeah, no, I keep wait. I keep waiting for the that was it the other shoe to. to, to speaking yeah, of shoes, yeah. I keep waiting for the other shoe to fall or whatever the expression <laughs> is because I I have had an unnaturally lucky life. Absolutely. Um, I, I'll tell you, John. How much time yeah. do we have? As much because, time as you have. I'll share one more story. If, if are you seeing my screen now? Yes, we see the yep. six, the nine, nine faces. Okay, so these are Amerasian children. Um, and these kids, uh, all of these kids are, well, there's Korea and Thailand are the two places I spent the most time, but they're in the Philippines, they're in Taiwan, they're every place where we have troops. They're in Germany, they're literally everywhere we have troops. And again, I'm not denigrating the GIs. I'm just saying that, you know, one of the things that was interesting to me in Korea was that there was a, a wonderful Marino priest that I spent a lot of time with who would go out to the villages and find these children and, and try to find families in, in America to adopt them. And he would actually go to the whorehouses where the where the GIs were hanging out, and he'd smoke with them, he'd drink with them. He said, "Guys, you know, screw your brains out, but don't get these girls pregnant. Like, use a condom. Like, you know, there's no reason. Like, just you know." Uh, he said, "I'm a priest. I'm not telling you don't, you know, have a good time. I'm just saying don't have consequences for other people." And you know, to me, that's what a religious person should do, not like this high holy thing. So um, I started finding these kids and. Um, I went to the, there's something called the Pearl Buck Foundation. It was an organization was set up where you could donate $15 a month and that would feed and educate a young child somewhere in the world. And so I went to this, this guy named Bob Hearn in Bangkok, who was running this organization. I said, um, can you introduce me to your compatriots around, the, you know, around the country? And he said, well, um, he said, in Korea, um, there's a guy there you should talk to. I went and met with this gentleman there. And I said, I'm looking for the most western looking child the, the the most fish out of water because i want it to be you know visually something where you there's no question this kid does not look at all you know korean so he found this 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 uh, child for it so the, uh, one of the things that i also found as i said the that these children end up either in jail or um you know as prostitutes uh, this is actually again back in the 70s um ironically enough um now a lot of the top models and rock stars in Asia are, are more Western looking. Like a lot of Amerasian kids now have become, it's a bizarre thing where on the one hand, they're ridiculed as children because they look different, but then they're, because they look different, they're unique. And as they become teenagers, some of them now, there was actually in Thailand, they did a whole TV show about a little boy who lived under a bridge who was Amerasian. He'd come out at night and, and rescue and save other people. Um, so I heard there was a little girl named Unsuk Lee living in a village up along the DMZ, just, just on, in South Korea, but just you know on the border of North Korea, and that she's being raised by her grandmother and that uh, the grandmother never let any Westerners ever see this girl. Even the social workers that brought money and everything, the grandmother always hidden her, but there were photographs of her and the girl looked quite amazing. So I went to this village with a translator and the people at the, at the Pearl Buck Foundation said, you can go there, but the grandmother's never gonna let you photograph this girl. And I figured, well, let's try. So I took a translator with me and, um, I spoke to the grandmother with the translator, explained I was a journalist. I didn't look like any GIs. Again, I had a beard and still had long hair. And, and uh, I said, I'm just doing this story about these children. And I've heard that your, your granddaughter is very beautiful and, and special and very unique. And I would love to take pictures. And to everybody's astonishment, the grandmother said, OK. And I also I was doing this on my own nickels. So um, I told the translator, um, could you come and help me persuade the grandmother but then I want to see if can you ask the grandmother if I can stay here for the week I bought a sleeping bag there's a little uh like a shed outside their house that I slept in at night and the thing that I noticed right away was the love between this little girl and her grandmother um, they would sleep on the floor together at night uh, this little girl as you saw from the last picture would study by candlelight there was no light natural light in the apartment um 
And um, the this girl was just absolutely just absolutely fascinating. And um, uh, I'm not showing you all the pictures here, but um, I said to her through the translator before the translator left because I was there by myself, not being able to speak for a week. I said, to the "Little girl, if I ever do anything to embarrass you, just put up your hand and say the word stop, and I'll stay stop taking pictures." So during the week. She would uh, show me off to the other kids at school. She'd hold my hand on the way to school. And every once in a while, she'd whisper in one of the other kids' ears. And then she'd look at me and go, stop. And I would stand there you know, and put my cameras down. All the girls would start giggling. Um, this is um, a pledging, you know, this is lining up in front of the school in the morning. Um, just absolutely striking girl. And, and what was so interesting about her is all the other children I'd photographed had this sort of concentration camp haunted like they wouldn't make eye contact, their shoulders were bowed over. They'd obviously been made fun of, beaten up, spit at, uh, ridiculed. I mean, imagine walking, you know, when you're a kid and you have a big nose or big ears, remember how painful that was? But imagine your earliest memory of people whispering and Koreans tend to say out loud what they think of you. And because she looks so Western, a lot of them didn't even think she understood, but she understood very well. But the grandmother was had been the village wise woman and the midwife. And so um, even though they were the poorest family in the village, the grandmother had demanded everybody treat this little girl with respect. There's only 300 people in the village. And so unlike the other children I photographed, this girl was funny. The teachers would ask questions. She'd raise her hand. She'd be the first at the, at the blackboard at recess. She was selecting which kids would be on her team. Um, absolutely fascinating. Um, the day came for me to leave at the end of the week. And uh, the grandmother, I said to the, I asked the translator to come back the last day so I could formally say thank you. And the translator starts talking to the grandmother. Unsuk is at school at that point. And uh, the grandmother starts crying. And so I said to the translator, why is she crying? And the translator talks to her for a minute and the translator starts crying. I said, okay, I, I must have done something bad here. Tell me what's going on. And the translator says, the grandmother says she's dying and she wants to know if you'll take Unsuk to America with you. And I said, you know, I'm 28 years old. I'm not married. I sleep on my sister's couch. I'm really immature. I'm really, I love your granddaughter. She is amazing. Um, but I'm, I, I, I don't even live anywhere. I, I mean, I, um, I said, I have, my best friend is uh, same age as me. And he has an 11 year old son, uh, like your daughter's 11, your granddaughter's 11. And I said, if you're serious, I can try to find a family, but why do you think you're dying? And can I take you to the hospital? Can I, and I give you some money? And, and, you know, I didn't know if I was being played because sometimes there's that sort of, you know, sucker thing that goes on with, with Westerners and, and, you know, people in different situations. But uh, the translator said, told me that she said she had stomach cancer and the doctors had told her she had six weeks to live. And I said, have you told Unsuk? And she says, Unsuk doesn't know. So I left, I wrote a letter to my best friends in Atlanta, Georgia, explain who this girl was and they contacted me back and said okay I said okay what they said okay we'll adopt her I said well, don't you want to see a picture of her did like what do you mean okay and they said well you said she was incredible so we'll adopt her and it's like okay I said I think I should go back and talk to the grandmother and make sure that I'm you know now that I wasn't there in front of the grandmother I thought am I I just wanted to make sure I understood what was going on and I also said to my friends if the grandmother's not dying I think maybe we should bring her over also and my friend said, wait, wait, we're not bringing a 65 year old woman into our house also. I said, well, I'll pay for her apartment. I mean, I'd made a lot of money from the camel trip, but on, uh, on so I met, I met Unsuk in September. My friend said, okay, to adopt in November. And on Christmas day, I was in Bangkok and I was about to fly back to um, Korea to talk to the grandmother to make sure that, that this is what she wanted. And uh, a guy from the desk, again, I was staying at full Jones Griffiths hotel room again. And the guy from the front desk came down and had a telex and said, somebody, is their name Smolin here? And I raised my hand and said, yeah. And he said, um, there's a telex here from Time Magazine saying somebody in Korea died and left you a child in their will. Do you know anything about this? So I went back to Seoul and um, um, the house was empty, um, snow blowing through it. This is now early January incredibly cold uh no, nobody will tell me where she is because the grandmother had always hidden her from everybody and i recognized the little girl she played with after school every day and so the translator and i cornered this little girl and the girl actually knew had an address she wrote on a piece of paper so we went to this horrible slum on the outside of seoul knocked on the door the door opens and she at unsuk opens the door and her eyes are bloodshot doesn't recognize me at all this man starts yelling at us from inside and i said to the translator what's he saying and she said he he wants us to leave 
I said, who is he? And she talks to him for a minute and she said, he's her uncle. And I said, tell him that I've come from America. I had not come from Bangkok, but whatever. I said, I've come from America because uh, I promised this little girl's grandmother, your mother, that I would find a family for her in America. And he said, he said, he knows who you are and he wants you to leave. He says, he says, we should go away. And he starts trying to close the door. And I, it's so cold. I just remember, um, and I remember again, it's like the movie thing. I'm thinking like, what can I, I, so I stuck my foot in the door. I said, look, tell him that I flew all the way here from America because of a promise I made to his mother. And um, I'm really cold and I just want to come inside and warm up for a minute and then I'll leave. And so she says this to him and he says, very reluctantly lets us in and sort of, you know, uh, gestures to the floor. So we sit down and um, I said, look, um, I'm so glad that you're going to take care of her. Is she going to go to school? And he goes, no, um, girls don't go to school. I said, um, what is, what is, and she just, you know, it was, it was like Cinderella, you know, you just had this mental picture of this poor happy girl now being enslaved. And at one point his baby started crying in the other room and he yelled at Unsuk and she went and got the, started changing the baby's diaper and then he yelled at her again and she brought us tea. And again, she, her face was, she's completely bloodshot. Her eyes are red. And uh, I said, you know, um, somebody taught me also like when you're in a situation like this, like you got to deflect. So I, I said, look, I'm so happy you're going to take care of her. I was just worried there was nobody here for her. It, it, I'm, I'm so relieved that you're here. I said, you know, what did you, what did you study in school? You know, what do you do? And he, oh, he said, he worked for a small hotel and he said he studied some English. And I said, look, you know, I'm stuck here for a week because, you know, the, back then you had to buy a ticket with a Saturday night stay over. I said, I'm, I'm staying downtown. Would you like to come for lunch tomorrow and you can practice English and we get to know each other? Again, I'm so happy that you're going to take care of Unsuk. And the translator, when we got outside and he said, yes, he would come to lunch. And the translator said, why did you give up? I said, I didn't give up. I said, let's go find some of the older Amerasians that you helped me with. There's a boy who's been out of jail. Remember the girl who's a prostitute? I want them to come to lunch tomorrow to my hotel. I want them to tell the uncle what people say to them when they walk down the street, what they do for a living and what's in store for her if she stays here. So they came the next day and within 10 minutes, we got thrown out of the restaurant because they started shouting and yelling at him instead of having a conversation. They started, they saw him as everything wrong with their lives. And so we get thrown out of the hotel and we're on the street and he's yelling at me. He's completely red faced and <clears throat> he's shouting at me. And, I, and I'm, I'm so depressed because I know I've fucked this whole thing up. And um, I said to the translator, what is he saying? And she said, he says, how dare you? How dare you walk into my house? You're some rich American with your cameras around your neck and you got to whisk this beautiful girl off to America. I, have nothing, I know nothing about you or your friends and the arrogance of accusing me of enslaving my own niece. Like, who the hell do you think you are? And I said to the translator, tell him he's right. And she said, what? I said, tell him he's right and tell him I apologize. And so she said that to him and he calmed down. And I said, look, I, I'm not trying to play God here. I said, look, you know, I made a promise to your mother. I said, these people, I know they've been yelling at you, but unfortunately in your country, your countrymen don't treat these children very well. And even if you love her as much as I'm sure you do, it doesn't seem like she has very much hope here of having a happy life. I said, if you like, I will fly my friends from America. You can meet them and decide if you think they're decent people. I said, there are adoption agencies that will vet all of this. I said, there's this priest that I know who works with families on both sides. Could you and I and Unsa just go meet the priest together? So we did that. We went down to the priest. Um, he actually invited me that the next day, there was actually a little ceremony where they, uh, <clears throat> they burn articles of clothing of the person who's died. And it was so, oh my God, you know, you guys are all photographers and it's so hard to take pictures. You talk about feeling like a parasite. Um, I'm, I'm, I cut out most of the pictures in the story because I didn't know how much time we had, but um, it was just so heartbreaking. Um, so this is uh, her and the uncle on the way down to Father Keen's. This is Father Keen, who's the most wonderful religious person I've ever met. So, um, Father Keen invited her to stay with him. Uh, we, we convinced the uncle to allow the adoption to go through. Father Keen said to the uncle, it might be good if she moved here into the orphanage because I can teach her some English and talk about her responsibilities to her new family. And so the uncle said, okay. Um, the Father Keen um, invited her to live there. And um, I left because I, I went off to another assignment. I arranged for my friends to fly to Korea. 
And I came back a week later and uh, there were 75 children in this orphanage. And it was Father Keen and two women and both of their children had been adopted. And uh, I came, showed up at the orphanage and Father Keen looked at me and said, come into my office. I need to talk to you about Unsuk. And he said, well, I need to talk to you about Natasha. And I said, who's Natasha? He said, oh, we, we, we gave her an American name. Uh, I, I think she got the name from Rocky and Bullwinkle cartoons because she was watching the American Air Force Station. She says that Father Keaton gave her the name Natasha, which is Russian name, but whatever. So I go into his office and he says, uh, I have to talk to you about Natasha. And I said, is something wrong? He goes, I'm uh, one guy. I've got two women here. We have 75 children in this orphanage. He said, the third day Natasha was here, she walked in and she wrote up a list of all the older children and assigned each of the older children to one of the younger children and assigned who's going to clean which rooms on which days. Um, she has organized movie night on Wednesdays where she takes all the older girls to movies. He said, she's running my entire orphanage. She's been here less than a week. Uh, she told me I'm messy and sloppy, that I need to run this place better. He said, I don't know who raised this child, but he said, I've had hundreds of kids come through this orphanage. I've never seen anything like this. He said, you know, uh, he said, I, I've, I think kids fall into three categories that, that have come to my orphanage. He said, we have glass children who are so broken by their experience of being ridiculed, beaten up, mocked, that we can't put their personalities together. They're just shattered human beings. He said, it's just heartbreaking. He said, we have plastic kids where nothing seems to affect them. They are who they are. It just bounces off and they are just, they're just, they're, they are who they are. And he said, I've only seen one other child that I, he said, I call them steel children, that the more adversity they go through, the stronger they get. He said, I don't know who raised this child. I don't know what her life's going to be like, but this girl is a leader. He said, uh, you know, basically she's running my orphanage. Um, so here she assigned one of the older kids to younger kids. These are the kids she assigned to herself and another girl that she became friends with. We went out to dinner. Uh, Jean, my friend Jean flew over, met the uncle. Someone told me also the last thing you ever want to do is let the the um, the, the parents that are giving up a child uh, meet the parents that are adopting the child. You want this perfect, wonderful family in America that the adoption agency tells you is perfect. You never actually, no one ever lives up to your expectations. Fortunately, my friend Gene is an inventor, a musician. He builds homes. He's a comedian. He does stand up. He's uh, he just he's like an incredible guy. Just the fact that he agreed he and his wife agreed to adopt the child without even meeting the child is extraordinary so we all went out the first night that the gene and he brought his son with him his, his daughter his uh, wife couldn't come so um the first night we all stayed in our hotel and i they we got a gene and his son got a room down the hall from me and uh Unsuk stayed in my room and the second night we went down to the orphanage and she wanted to show off her new father and brother to all the other kids so we all slept on the floor with the kids of the orphanage and I didn't keep the second room at my hotel because again, I'm paying for all this. So the third night we went out to dinner and Jean was teaching uh, Natasha how to use a knife and fork. And then she taught him how to use chopsticks. And we went back to my hotel room and uh, I said, could I get that same empty room next to mine for Jean and his son? And, and the guy at the front desk said, sir, we're really full tonight. It was a small Korean hotel. It was like 15 floors. He said, uh, we don't, we only have one room free right now. It's on the fifth floor. Uh, my room is on the 11th floor. And Jean said, and we were actually thinking of giving the kids their own room if we'd been next to us. And Jean said, you know, I'm not comfortable having the kids five floors away. He said, and I said, you know what? Oh, his son said, dad, I have a sleeping bag. I'll sleep on the floor. And I said, yeah, Jean, I have a sleeping bag too. Tim and I can sleep on the floor. Natasha can get one bed. You get the other bed. Everything's fine. So the kids pass out. It's been incredibly exciting three days. Um, we turn off the lights. Jean's in, in one bed, Natasha's in the other. Um, I've been in this hotel now for about six weeks and they all always overheat the hotel during the day. So the room is always like 95 degrees. So I always left the window open during the day. And then every night at midnight, they turn the heat off in the hotel. And then I remember at one o'clock in the morning, I'd stagger out of my bed and close the window because the room had dropped to 20 below zero. So, you know, sure enough, you know, one o'clock in the morning comes, the room gets cold. I get up to close the window and I hear voices outside shouting. And I think, oh, the bars must have just gotten out. And I close the window and I get back on my sleeping bag and I'm hearing these voices and I'm not hearing anger, I'm hearing terror. I don't speak a word of Korean, but you know, when you hear terror, you understand what that is in any language. So I stagger back to the window. I open my window and there's flames coming up the side of our hotel and the hotel's on fire. Uh, so I walk over to Gene, I run over to Gene, I wake him up, said, Gene, 
don't freak out. I think our hotel's on fire. And he, what, what? I said, and he's jet lagged out of his mind. He, you know, it's like 18 hour time difference. And he runs to the window. There's now flames coming by our window on the 11th floor. So we're all panicked. We try to get the kids up. And any of you have kids, you know what it's like when they've been asleep for an hour? It's like they took five Valiums, you know, and plus they're jet lagged. Their heads are all over the place. We can't talk to her because we don't speak a word of Korean. And we're trying to get them up. And I remember his son had LL bead boot laces. And we're trying to tie these bootlaces. We're hearing people screaming in the hall, these weird thumps and crashes. I still don't even know what that was. And uh, my first thought is not my passport, not my traveler's checks or my tickets. I have 150 rolls of film that I've been shooting of her that have not been developed. And Jean is like, leave the fucking film. We're going to die in the fire. And I, I, no, I got to take my film. So I'm grabbing the film. We run to the door. Jean goes first, then his son, then me. And I'm trying to drag her and she will not let go. She's holding on to the doorknob. She won't, she won't leave the room, right? And, and she's holding on to the door and I'm trying to pull her out of the room. She's screaming and Jean turns and it was like walking into a blast furnace. We open the door and there's smoke. There's people screaming in the hall. There's just like utter chaos. And Jean turns around and shoves us all back in the room and we're all choking. And he said, we're not going to make it. He said, Rick, we're not going to make it. This, we're going to die from the smoke. We close the door and the whole room is now filled with smoke. I remember I couldn't even see him across the room. His son has asthma and his son kills over on the floor. And Gene's the same age as me, but he's married. He's a family man. You know, he's like a solid guy. He's much bigger than me. And when he starts sobbing, that's when I lost it. Because until that moment, I thought, you know, I've been in lots of situations with Gene where he's gotten us out of some tough jams. And I remember thinking, I had two unbelievable emotions. One was absolute terror and just, God, this has got to be a bad dream. I just want to wake up. This can't be happening, please. And the second was unbelievable guilt that I've been playing God with all these people's lives, you know, thinking I'm such a great guy. And, you know, you know, I was kind of feeling smug about all this and like, wow, I've saved this girl and, you know, made all these connections. And now I've just killed my best friend and his son and this girl, and it's all my fault. And um, Gene's laying on the floor and he says, Rick, do you have gaffer's tape? I said, what? He said, you have gaffer's tape. And I'm thinking, what the hell? He said, Rick, we're going to die from the smoke. All we can do now is stop the smoke. That's all we can do. We can't get out of here. We have, we're going to die from the smoke. We have to stop the smoke. That's all we can do. So we put blankets at the bottom of the door to block the smoke. There's smoke pouring in through the vents and the window under the door, uh, through the walls. And we put room service menus over the, over the, the vents in the wall. We soak towels. This is all Gene. Um, and we put towels over our faces. So we could breathe through the towels. Uh, we were getting so dizzy at this point. And so I opened the window, which I closed at that point. We put the kins of the windowsill trying to get some air. And right across from us is the scaffolding of a building going up. And there's all these photographers on the scaffolding waiting for people to jump. There's no fire engine. No one's trying to get us out. It's just all these fucking parasites. And I remember thinking, I'm not a paparazzi, but I swear to God, I mean, I'm not religious either, but I remember thinking, God, if we get out of this, I swear I'll do something else, like my life, something like, you know, I mean, it was just like looking into this bizarre mirror of, you know, here is Robin accusing me of being a parasite and here all these guys just, and, and below us, people started jumping out as the fire went up. It started on the fifth floor. It, everybody, 11 people died, um, some from smoke inhalation, four people actually jumped out of windows below us. Um, Finally, the fire truck showed up. They put up a ladder and the ladder stops on the ninth floor, we're on the 11th floor. And it's just, we're looking out the window and the ladder is just in the breeze going back and forth. And Gene says, let's not cheat. We can not cheat so we can lower kids to the ladder. And we're all soaked now from the towels. It's 20 below zero. There's no one on the ladder to catch the kids. And I said, Gene, we can't lower the kids to the ladder. They're gonna, they're gonna slip or fall. And we turn on the radio somehow thinking, because we've been listening to the Air Force radio station, we thought somehow the radio would have a report and they were playing Chicago's Uptown Woman. And we both look at each other and we start <laughs> laughing. Like, we're dying in a hotel fire listening to Chicago's up, Uptown Woman. There's a bottle of Kahlua that I had on the night table and the two of us proceed to drink the entire bottle of Kahlua just to calm down. Um, there's this loud pounding on the door and... Um, you know, this room has now come to represent safety. It's our womb. You know, we've taped up the doors. We've taped, we're not letting anybody in the room. I don't care who they are. They're shouting in Korean. And um, Natasha tried to go over to the door and I, I pulled her away from the door. We won't let her open it. They go away and about five minutes later, they're banging on the door again. And I go and Natasha tries to open the door and I walk over to try to stop her. And she kicks me in the shins. 
And she opens the door and it's firemen trying to get us out. They're yelling, is there anybody in there? So they take us out. There's a fire escape right there. We could have gone out the minute the fire started. Of course, I'd never check where the fire escape was. And we go into the lobby and there's people passed out all over the ground. Um, they're, now the, fire, the firemen are there and they're pouring, they're pumping water into the floors above us and no one's doing anything. Everybody's completely passive and like nobody's helping anybody. And so Jean says to the manager of the hotel, these people are going into shock. You need to give them whiskey or brandy or something because you know, they're all, everybody's soaked. There's what, and there's now water coming through the ceiling. And so Jean, the, the manager of the hotel says, I don't have the key to the liquor cabinet. So Gene takes off his coat, wraps his fist up and smashes it open. And then we go around and we start giving everybody little glasses of brandy and stuff. And we, we got towels, we're wrapping people in and every, I mean, everybody was literally just frozen. No one was in charge. Nobody knew what to do. And then I said to Gene, I think the ceiling's going to collapse. I mean, they're just pouring water in the floors above us and we're watching water starting to drip. So we say to the manager, we need to move everybody out of the lobby across the street to the other hotel. And the manager says, there's a curfew. You're not allowed on the street at night. And Gene says, you know, fuck the curfew. So we just lead everybody out. The, the manager was just like deer in the headlights. So we take everybody out of the hotel. We get, we, we're, we're you know, um, we knock on the door of another hotel and they let us in. Uh, film crews showed up and they're interviewing people about it. And Unsuk, who's curious, walks over there. And at one point when the, when the photographers were on the balcony across from us, I was shouting, you goddamn assholes, like call for a fire, call a fire truck. So Unsuk walks over looking like she's Western, like the rest of us. And suddenly she interrupts one of the film crews and they all turn the cameras on her. And I hear her saying, God damn, God damn. And she's like mimicking what I had said to the film crews. I, I'm killing myself now that I never try to get a copy of that, of the, of the interview they did that night. So um, this was Jean just before the fire showing uh, Natasha where uh, Atlanta was on the map. I kept shooting during the fire. I have pictures of them on the windowsill. This is coming down the fire escape. I mean, my friends have said, wait, you're still taking pictures and you think you're dying? And I said, well, Part of me is a way of distancing myself from the terror. And part of it is I figured if we die, it doesn't matter. And if we don't die someday, hopefully this will be a good story. This is in the lobby where all of our clothes smelled so terrible. Um, the officials told us that it was gonna take, so we survived. Um, the officials told us it was gonna take a year for the adoption to go through, that she was gonna have to live at Father Keen's for a year. So I got the name of every official in the United States and in Korea involved in, in signing her adoption papers. And in four months, I told them how famous they would be when the story was published. I've never published the story. This story has never been published. I just decided the best gift I could give her was to actually stick it in a safe deposit box. So this is on the way that that last picture was her great aunt putting on Korean clothes. I told her she could get dressed just before we landed in Atlanta. Cause it's gonna be like 28 hours between all the flights we had to change, but she wanted to wear this all the way. Um, the pilot, on the Cathay Pacific plane was a guy named Jeff uh, Westerfield, who I'd actually flown with many times. And when I told him the story, he invited her to sit in the cockpit and he went back and adopted one of the kids two months later. He was so taken with her story. Just to make this even cornier, Gail, her new mother, was three days away from giving birth to her own daughter. Can you imagine adopting a child that doesn't speak a word of your language, literally when you're about to have your own first daughter? Amazing family. Um, she hated my beard, and so my deal with her is when we got to Atlanta, she, she, could, uh, she could cut off my beard. So this is a picture of her um, cutting off my beard. Um, she started seventh grade three months later, speaking English at her own uh, age level. She didn't stay back. She literally learned English in three months and entered seventh grade with other seventh graders. This is pledging allegiance for the first time in Atlanta. Um, remember how much you look like your grandmother in those early pictures? People always used to comment on how much you look like Gail. Like a lot of adoptive families try to erase the history of their child to make them you know, appear to be one of them. Gail and Jean did the opposite. They bought Korean clothes for the entire family. They went to Korean church on Sundays. They learned to speak Korean. Just an unbelievable family. Wow. Um, I traded uh, computer, I traded photography for Natasha to go to computer camp. Commodore in, uh, 64. California. Yeah, exactly. This was probably 1982, maybe 81, something like that. All of her first boyfriends were blondes. 
She became captain of the cheerleaders in high school, uh, homecoming queen in the middle there. Um, after high school, um, she got hired by Delta Airlines. Uh, I got Kodak to hire her at the Olympics. She went back to Korea and was a translator at the Olympics where she met Jeff Pruss, who uh, was uh, working for Canon cameras and they fell in love. This is her wedding day. Again, I, I, I cut out most of the slides here. As Jean looking a little older, walking her down the aisle. Jean and uh, Natasha and Jeff at their wedding. <laughs> As her first child, Sydney, who just turned 16. Aww. This is Evan. It's their Christmas card um, 10 years ago or something now. And that's uh, the picture on the right was taken a few months ago, um, sort of reproducing <laughs> history. So, anyway, I'm sorry I've been going on so long here, John. No, right? that's, that's such a wonderful um, story. Um, and if people want to hear more of it, they can always go to your um, EG talk on TED Talks. Yeah, it's a long, it's sort of long, longer version. Um, it's an incredible um, story. I wish it would never, wish we had more time <laughs> to hear more because I know that you have, you have more stuff in the bottom of your shoes. <laughs> needs to be told. <laughs> Right, I'll, I'll have to remember. I have to remember that one, uh, Michael. But I, 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 I need. Can I just uh, tell Rick something? Yeah. I, 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 I think you only know part of the story. But when you were doing the day in the life of um, Africa, of Canon Explorers of Light, which I created. Um, that um, wanted to go and become part of this day in the life. And there was some sticky parts of the, the Canada Explorer of Light contract, uh, which I actually wrote, that bothered me when all this came up. Um, and I said that the, 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 this day in the life thing that you were doing was so compelling and needed to be done and some of the photographers that wanted to that wanted to go should be allowed to go. Okay. Oh, because Olympus was sponsoring it, but they were Canon photographers. I see. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Now, that's that that story came out not by me, but by the Canon photographers, and uh, there were some Nikon photographers that wanted to go also and Nikon mm -hmm. refused to allow them to go. Mm. And when one particular photographer heard what I had done with the Canon photographer contract, I received a phone call from him, who I knew previous years, and he wanted me to come out to his house out on Long Island, which I did. Um, and he right out told me that it's because of what I did for humankind or new, uh, the <laughs> suffering or whatever, uh, I, allowing this thing to happen because it was a worthwhile project that he wanted to become an explorer of light, which blew me away. <laughs> Now, I, love it. I, I have been out of Canon since 19, uh, since 2003. Yeah. The photographer has since, unfortunately, passed away. Mm -hmm. um, and I had, I always had the greatest respect for him. And I know that you did too. I know a lot of people did. Um, I will tell you that his first name is Pete. And I'm all of that, I'm sorry. No, I'm I'm sorry that he passed away. Obviously, yeah. yeah. Uh, Pete has Pete has passed. It's Pete Turner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That yes, yeah. And it's because of that incident and you that literally 
opened my eyes and woke me up to what was actually happening in the world around me mm. and how we communicate uh, not so much with words, but with the images that we create. Although there are a group of photographers in, that were in my group that to this day are incredible uh, writers. One of them is Eric Mayola. Oh, yeah, um, sure. Uh, Eric, uh, uh, I always said that the only thing better than Miola's images are other words that he writes. Um, um, so to this day, I, I, I as much as I, I promoted, <laughs> as much yeah, as I right. promoted Canon and, and even Nikon when I was a Nikon school instructor, um, these these cameras that we use to communicate visually with are our tools. They're just tools. Mm -hmm. um, it's um, you know the, the the guy that does the, the that builds a house doesn't go around saying I I, I that the name of the hammer that he's using, <laughs> or the, right. the 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 person yeah. that writes you know the great American novel is not saying well. It's because of my Smith Corona typewriter. I mean, I'm, I'm, old, I'm old school. It's you not know. the tool, right? It's it's the eye yeah. behind the tool. Yeah. You know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump, Jim, jump in really quick because um, I have to run. Um, this has been just an extraordinary presentation by you, Rick. I I I I, 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 I am I am speechless, um, and it's which is a good thing. <laughs> it's been wonderful hearing from you. The, the first story you told was like bright in my day, like I can't even tell you. Um, Thank you. Your, your story about the adoption of this of this wonderful girl is just incredible. So um, yeah, I, uh, I'm gonna agree with Nuller uh, anyway. I'd love to know more about what's on the bottom of your shoe and hope you get plenty more on the bottom. Yeah, the yeah I think I'd like to just go back to Rick and just maybe give a couple of minutes about what you're doing with Against All Odds Productions and what your latest projects are. Yeah, actually, let me, I wanted to just jump, because I think the project that I've been working on most recently is actually the most relevant to what's happening in the world right now. Let me try one more time if this works, John, to share it. The good so, fight. Um, I happen to have a copy of it right here with me. So, you know, it seems like if you were uh, Jewish, Muslim, uh, gay, black, Native American, African American, um, Latino American, or handicapped, would you rather be in uh, 1921 or 2021? So think about that for a minute. There's, you know, the world and America is facing a lot of problems right now. And the last four years have been, feel like we've been going backwards. But if you actually look at the astounding progress that America has made towards openness, equality, uh, uh, fairness, and sort of justice for all, it's astounding how different life is today than it was 100 years ago. And that's by no means to say that our problems are solved. They certainly aren't. But I thought instead of doing original photography, which is all the projects I've done have been you know, sending photographers out, um, I, I, I thought, wouldn't it be interesting if you could go back and look through the eyes of photographers over the last 100 years of the astounding progress that, uh, that's been made in this country, just to remind people how fragile that progress and how recent it is. So we did this book, which was incredibly well received. As you can see, you know, it was one of Amazon's top books. Ted gave it out to everybody at TED. People called it one of the books of the year. Um, and uh, these are the kind of sort of pictures that, that it was such a, an honor to look through uh, archives to go to the basements of photographers' families to find some pictures that were very well known and some that no one had ever seen before. So, you know, in 2015, Supreme Court ruled that same sex marriages would be recognized equally in every state, and 123,000 people got married that year. This picture is absolutely astounding by Yoongi Kim from Contact Press Images. And these headlines, you see this, you know, watching right now the, the chart, the the trial of uh, George Floyd that's going on. Um, this is, we see this over and over again, right? Throughout history, especially recently, you know, there's six policemen charged, there's a mistrial and the judge acquits everybody on all counts. I hope that's not what's gonna happen with the, the case of George Floyd, but um, 
the power of photography, instead of hearing statistics, but to actually see the human beings who are mourning, whose lives have been affected, the incredible unfairness of it. But the book is not like a big depressing look at all this unfairness. It shows the problems historically, but then it also shows heroes, people that stood up, that used their, that took a knee, that, that used their influence, their reputation to try to change the tra trajectory for their for the other people that were like them. The other thing is we found each of these groups learned from the other. Um, one of the things in the book, and again, I'm a tech junkie, is that um, you can point your phone um, at 63 different pictures in the book and it plays a TED talk, a YouTube video, a commercial, a documentary. So there's three and a half hours of video. It's almost like an advent calendar where you peel the, the picture back and then there's something underneath it. You know, for uh, especially for young people today, I have two teenagers and if anything they can do with their phone is a hundred times more interesting than an old fashioned fuddy-duddy actual physical book. Um, we just found so many incredibly inspiring stories. We had great writers in the book as well. And we're now, uh, you know, John was asking me to talk about what I'm working on right now. We're actually developing this as a 10 part TV series narrated from by people who come from each of these groups. Uh, so this talks a little bit about the, the smartphone component where you can you know, point at it. Um, if, if any of you are interested in, in you know, talking more about these projects, this is my email and my phone number. It's my cell phone in here in New York. I'm happy to, to chat. Um, so this is one of the projects, it, you know, um, People say what's against all odds, and it's it's a little bit like a uh, um, like a movie studio. Like right now, there's two of us, three of us actually, and then sometimes we're we're 500 people. So we you know, sort of pass the baton and pass the torch from each group, you know, to the next. Um, I still pinch myself every day that I'm not back in college, and this is some drug-induced hallucination. Like, sure, Adam Driver plays me in a movie. Sure, I had the cover of National Geographic. I mean, none of this. You know, and you can imagine my father, you know, God bless him while he was alive. Uh, uh, you know, he, he said the world doesn't work this way. Like, you know, if you want to be a photographer, you spend 40 years doing some low level job at a small newspaper or a photography studio. And then by the time you're 50, maybe you work for like a regional magazine. So to go from doing the yearbook to working for Time magazine just broke every rule that my father had in his head about the way the world works. And I, I said, I, I you know. What did, your father, you what, what did your father have to say about the, uh, the profession that you, you were really born into? Um, you know, years later, he, he, you know, he was obviously very proud. Um, you know, I, I always, I, I still, he died 15 years ago, and I still, when I'm in a tight spot, find myself going you know, to reach for the phone and then realizing he's not at the other end of the line. I always you know, used to run ideas by him. He helped me. Uh, you know, structure, you know, my partnership with, with David Cohen, you know, my long-term partner on, on a lot of these projects. Um, you know, he was, you know, in, in a way, he was kind of wise the way Robin was wise. You know, he just had this innate wisdom. Um, and uh, I asked him one day why he didn't tell me he'd been a photographer in World War II. And he said, because I thought it would, you know, uh, encourage you. <laughs> uh, he said, you know, I was assigned that as a job. It was like a low-level job. And um, he said, you know, it wasn't something he would have chosen. And uh, he said, it never occurred to me that you could, you know, he said, I just thought you were, you know, living, a, he had a, this totally unrealistic idea of what you were going to do. And, you know, maybe, maybe when you don't know what's possible, like the day in the life book shouldn't have worked. I, I didn't mention this, John, to everybody listening, but I got turned down by 35 publishers who told me what a stupid idea it was. They said, you know, um, why, you know, the, why would you want to fly 100 photographers to some country on the other side of the world on a day that nothing happens? Like buy stock photos from Getty Photo and call it day in the life. Who would ever know that pictures weren't taken on one day? Do it the size of Time Magazine because it's cheaper to print. Do it in black and white. I mean, there's every excuse in the book. So I went back to the prime minister who had brought me to Australia in the first place and said, you know, that program that you used to bring me to Australia, could you bring 100 photographers here? And he said, you know, nice try. He said, I don't have that kind of budget. He said, you know, I, we, we have enough for six photographers. I said, yeah, but I want to do like the Olympics of photography in your country. He said, well, you know, I can't give you the money, but I'll help you. And I thought he's just, you know, one of these, you know, shiny me on being polite. And, you know, it's again, like go off and do this. And, you know, He said, no, 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 I'm going to help you. He said, I'm going to set up meetings for you with the CEO of Qantas Australia. 
Kodak Australia, Hi Hyatt Australia, Hertz Australia, and this guy, Steve Jobs, starting this computer company in America. This is 1980. And I said, why would I want to talk to some computer guy or these business people? He said, Rick, 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 you're going to ask them for free hotel rooms, airline tickets, film, cars, computers. And I said, they're just going to give me this stuff for free. And he says, yeah, because you're going to put their logo in the front of your books. I said, I can't do that. I'm a journalist. That would be selling out. This is like a, it's like a PBS special. The following book is made possible through the generosity of, and no one had ever done sponsored books before. So I went out there and it didn't occur to me that having the prime minister of Australia set up a meeting for you, they'd be kind of inclined to listen. I still, I met with probably 300 companies and, and eight said yes, which, you know, I, I learned a great lesson in rejection, but the other he thing- was that happened, He was your mentor. He was your mentor. No, he was incredible. I mean, literally in, in 10 minutes in his office, he outlined like almost my entire life. But the other thing that happened, not only did they give us hotel rooms and film and, 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 and computers, uh, uh, they were so, like Kodak ran full page ads in the Wall Street Journal saying, we're so proud to be the official, you know, as Michael knows, you know, um, you know, Olympus and Canon and, and, and uh, Nikon, all the camera companies literally were fighting over who was going to be the official sponsor. So we suddenly had a multi-million dollar marketing budget. It, it's, it's, again, every time something goes wrong, it, you know, it, it's like, you, you think this is, this is terrible. Like I got turned on by 35 publishers, but it was the greatest gift they ever gave me because I'd be, do you guys know that? Well, you probably do. If, if any of you have done a book on a $50 book, the person publishing it probably makes $1.75, right? On a $50 book. So, you know, on the other hand, you know, uh, you're taking enormous risk as the publisher, but but if you if the book take if we sell we sold 1.4 million copies of, uh, of of a day in the life of America, so that was a lot of money for you know if you're not, if you're making you know 15 dollars a book instead of a dollar 75 a book, it makes a big difference. So, um, and the the, sec the last story I'm going to tell, and then I'll shut up, which is that um, when we were doing day in life at Japan, I went to Apple Computer in Japan and asked if I could borrow. A Mac SE or something, and the guy who was the director of, of sales, he was an American guy living in in Japan, but he had an old Japanese staff. He said, uh, "You know, why do you need this?" I said, "Well, you know, Apple's been a sponsor of our previous books." And um, he said, well, "Where are you? Where are you running your project out of?" I said, "I don't know. We're, we're looking for office space right now, probably out of the hotel or something." He said, "Well, Apple just bought." Um, two towers in the Toho Twin Tower building in Tokyo. And one tower is completely empty. If you guys want to move in here and run your project out of the project, it would probably be good for our Japanese team to see creative people because we're all doing spreadsheets and all these business things. So we move into Apple's headquarters. And uh, a week before the project, Steve Jobs comes over for a visit. I had met him once or twice before, but very in passing. And he walks in our office and it, they're giving him a tour. And he says to the Japanese guy, these people are, don't work for Apple, but they're living, they're working out of our office. Like who, who authorized this? What are they doing here? Why would you? And he was like really angry and he walks out and I'm like, oh my God, we're going to get kicked out of our offices. This is back in the day of faxes, right? There was no way we could have then been able to, we were going to lose every, the whole project was going to fall apart. And so Steve walks back in the office. He goes, you know, they told me that you guys are freeloading off of us and that you're taking, you know, advantage of, you know, we, we giving all this stuff. And he said, and I thought he was about to say you have to get out, but he said, you know, the Japanese are the highest per capita rate of savings in the world. And if you guys are all journalists and you're here, you're going to have to help us figure out how to get the Japanese to take some of that hard-earned money and, and buy Apple computers. So I said, uh, Steve, um, uh, first of all, thank you so much for allowing us to stay here. But I said, we have $1,000 to pay each of the photographers for working on this project. Is there any way that you would let us spend that thousand dollars on Macintoshes, which at that point cost $2,600 and, and, and give them the latest Mac, a printer and a ton of software. And we can get these Macintoshes into Newsweek, Time, National Geographic, the Asahi Shinbun, you know, parity match, we, 30 countries, your, your computers will end up. And so he did it. And so we ended up using, paying photographers for almost the next eight years, a thousand computers went to the, not only the photographers, but we had the editors of National Geographic and Time and Life all also flying over to work on these projects. So we kind of seeded the entire magazine uh, world with Max uh, through almost being thrown out of Apple's offices. And, uh, um, you know, we started designing, we did the first coffee, best-selling coffee table book ever done on a Mac. 
Um, and in fact, uh, as I think John said at the beginning of this talk, um, I did an interactive CD that came with a book about Robin called From Alice to Ocean. And uh, Apple, nobody remembers this, Apple was the first computer company to ever put a CD-ROM uh, player, you know, an, uh, an actual CD-ROM device into a, a computer. And every single computer the first year, 500,000 computers came with that interactive CD disc. Now it's so crude, but at the time, it, nobody ever, in the Wall Street, Walt, Walt Mossberg, the Wall Street Journal did a whole column about it. It was great. So Robin wasn't very happy with it. She didn't like the idea of her I would story be being. Very, I would be very happy if the next time you come out with something like what we're just experienced today or in a book or in a CD or on a TV show or whatever, <laughs> just call it uh, stuff at the bottom oh, my of my shoe. shoes. <laughs> Actually, I wanted to go back one more story though with um, the day in the life of Australia. Who was your hundredth photographer? Oh, damn it. You know, that's a great question. I don't, John, you know what? Um, Wasn't it the premiere? I, Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Yes, it was actually. Uh, <laughs> <duh>. <laughs> I have to see my brain is a little addled here. So uh, when when uh, Malcolm Fraser, the prime minister, helped me he, at the end of the um, at, at the end of like laying out my entire life for the next 40 years, he said, uh, I want something in return for helping you. And I thought, OK, here it comes. And he said, I want to be one of the 100 photographers on your project. Oh. And I I was going to say no because he, you know he wasn't a real photographer, and my friends were going, "Are you an idiot? Like it doesn't matter if he's a good photographer or not." It's like, I was so oblivious in terms of what good PR was. I've, I've obviously learned then, but at the time, I not luckily I I, I said, "Let me talk to the team" because I didn't want to just say, "Of course." Um, and he had a picture of his daughter eating corn or something at home, uh, but you know it, it's also funny that it all the whole thing started with him touring the Nikon factory. Um, you know, again, these threads, you think any one of these threads at any point. Well, I just thought it was ironic to going back to you becoming the hundredth photographer when John Longo and I spun right, and said, no, John, okay, go for I, it. Until you said that, literally, no one has ever said that before. Really? Like, <laughs> I, it's like, duh. <laughs> no, you just did what Robin did. It's like, quack. How could you not have remembered like the irony of that? You're right. You're right. That's amazing. <laughs> I have a uh, question. You, yeah, Harris has a question for you before we uh, close up. Two questions. I still have a lust. A, a, I need to see those first two photos that started the project, that started your life back at that Life magazine. <laughs> you know, I, 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 have, I did actually, I did find the photograph in a box somewhere recently. So um, I will try to, Harris, I'll try to find it and share it with you. <laughs> okay, yeah, give it to John. I think you'd all like to see those. Two and, images. And I apologize, uh, John, to everyone else. I've got a call. I've got to take in like four minutes that uh, about a new project that I can't. I cool. can't uh, uh, no. uh, delay okay. it. So I've got some. You got to go. You got to go. Anyway, thank okay. you. Yeah, thank, yeah, thank you so much. much. This is one of the best I think we've done. <laughs> this has been a, this has been thank amazing, you. Rick. Thank you for for so your much, vision. Guys. I have your book, and um, yeah, good luck to you with everything. Well, I'll try and see if I can we can catch up. But thank you, John. Thank you, John. Fabulous as always. Correct. I have I one Jeff question. Had a question. Everybody. Yeah, Jeff I had a first question. I just have one question. Does your mouth ever get tired? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's us New Jersey guys. It's all of us New <laughs> Jersey. I'm not. I'm not quite as shy as I was when I was 16. That's all. <laughs> I and and the other question <laughs> is, will you come back again? Of course, I'd be honored. Okay. Thank you. Great. Next week. Right. Thanks, Jeff. <laughs> Well, Thank I'll you, talk Rick. to Rick. Go, Rick. Go, go take your Thank phone you, call. Yeah, Thank go. you Thanks so much. Go. Go. Hey, Rick, you'll you be a good. Be good. <laughs> be, 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 just be careful. And I love you. I really do. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. Hey. Bye, everybody. Hey,